one. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here as a continuation of our FY25 operating budget discussion with regards to our Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, I am Gabriel Gugnos, Chair of the HHS Committee, joined by Councilmember Ludke, who is also a member of the committee. Uh, I understand Councilmember Sales will be joining us in a little bit. We are also joined by two colleagues and friends, Councilmember Stewart and Councilmembers Mink, uh, who are here to talk about, I believe, the first item of the four that we will be discussing this afternoon, and that is an overview of the operating budget, specifically of our services to end and prevent homelessness, or CEF, as uh, they are also known. Uh, the second item we will be discussing after that is the Supplemental Appropriation 2472 to the FY24 uh, 20, operating budget, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Shelter Services, Overflow, and Security Expansion uh, in the amount of $1,739,394 and amendments to the FY24 Operating Budget Resolution 2184, Section G, Designation of Entities for Non-Competitive Contract Award Status, the Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless and Interfaith Works. And third, we will be discussing uh, administration and support services, and we will round out the afternoon by talking about our Office of Food System Resilience. Uh, we are joined by other colleagues in the executive branch from DHCA who will be participating in the first part of our conversation and then have another committee session that they have to attend in a little bit. And so we have a lot to get to. And so Ms. Clemens Johnson, I will turn it over to you to um, give us an overview and walk us through the packet. If I could jump in real quick there, thank you so much, Ms. Clemens Johnson. And we have been receiving uh, questions from providers um, about the process, and so we wanted to reinforce and sort of level set so everybody gets the same message at the same time and hears the same thing. But I will note for council members making Stewart, we discussed this last week, this approach makes a lot of sense on the surface, but does present some unique challenges to HHS because although these programs are technically new by through the perspective of the operating budget, these are continuation of programs that in many cases were started during COVID. And as we've all discussed publicly, 
the need persists in a number of key areas. And so we are going to follow the rules, um, but I'll just note with an asterisk um, that these really aren't new programs, um, but, but we'll be seen that way through this process. So with that, I yield back to you, Ms. Clemens Johnson. Um, so getting started with the CEF overview, um, the services to end and prevent homelessness service area, the FY25 recommendation is 49.4 49 million dollars, a reduction of 16.8 percent, mostly due to the removal of um, ARPA funds. Uh, so we are starting today's session reviewing the rental assistance program supported through the Housing Initiative Fund. So um, the Housing Opportunity Commission staff, I believe someone is here from there. Yes, the director is here and um, we have our director Scott Bruton with DHCA um, for the first 30 minutes of this discussion. So I will be quick so you guys can get to the meat and potatoes. Um, so I hope, but I was like the packet says, we are starting today reviewing the rental assistance program. Uh, most county funny, funded rental assistant is funded through the recordation tax. These revenues and expenditures are approved in the Housing Initiative Fund and spent in collaboration with DHHS and the Housing Opportunities Commission. The recordation and transfer taxes are projected to be lower in FY25 than the FY24 original approved levels. Overall, the amount of uh, the HIP funding will be dedicated to Overall, the amount of HIP funding that will be dedicated to rental assistance has been held to a small reduction, uh, 658740 uh, overall within DHHS, or 4% uh, giving the lower amount of recordation tax and tax premium. Um, the biggest decrease that we see is in rapid rehousing of $500,000. So if you go through your packet, we have the chart listed here of um, DH, DHHS and HOC. And on the following, we have questions that um, the committee should consider. Uh, namely, with the reduction noted, what will be the impact on the rental assistance programs as, rent as, re as rents are increasing? What are the number of households that can be assisted in FY25? How will HOC manage, how will HOC and DHHS manage their funding for FY25? and what impact does DHHS expect to see from the reduction of the rapid rehousing. Um, so we did want to note in this last bullet here that there are 72 permanent supportive housing units that are expected to come online through the HUD funding that are still in that are still ways in which the county can continue to house people through coordinated entry and programs in the continuum of care. So we just wanted to bring that up because we don't talk about the continuum of care during the budget work session, but we do get a significant amount of funding from HUD that supports our community partners. Um, although those programs are very targeted, but they still help the homeless um, residents of the county and our options for, um, for the department to use. So I will stop right there. And, uh, Thank you so much. Um, what a welcome, Ms. Andrews. Thank you so much for your um, partnership and your leadership. And I assume Mr. Hodge, you're here representing Dr. Bridgers. So if you'd like to make some opening comments as we dive into this section of HHS's work. Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Mark Hodge. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Department of Health and Human Services. I bring greetings and apologies from Dr. Um, Bridgers, our, our director. He is currently supporting his wife in Kentucky. She's receiving a um, very important award for the work that she does at, um, at Howard University. And so he's, uh, he's there supporting her and wishes he could be here, but um, it's good to be with his wife. So <laughs> even better. So um, we're, we're happy to be here um, and answer all of your questions today about the budget. Um, I think this is a very um, well thought out um, and, um, and a, a, a budget that works for all of us. And so we're happy to be here. Thanks. Great. Song, did you want to make any opening comments? Yes, thank you so much for all of your supportiveness and we're really eager to continue our work coming in FY25. We have a lot of work to do. We know that the number of homeless that we are seeing in our county is increasing and that's demonstrated by a number of indicators. So we are looking for the council support um, in the resources that we need to continue to serve those most in need. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then uh, colleagues, um, as you speak, just introduce yourselves, but rather than go down the line, let's get jumped in. So why don't we go to the first item? Uh, the first item would be discussion of the rental assistance programs. The budget recommended, the budget in the HIF recommended for DHH, DHHS is seven seven million eight hundred fifty nine 
330,000, which is a reduction of 32,000. Our suggestion was, um, since the HOC is here and they also run a rental assistance program and all of the funding this year is coming from the HIF, um, there's around 800,000 in uh, general funds for the rental assistance program, which is just a small portion of, of um, which in total would bring it to about eight, um, 8.8 .8 million or 8.6 million. So this discussion was to just have a discussion about both programs and understand how the HIP dollars are being used across the program. And if the committee wanted to consider um, any other funding for the programs this year. Thank you and good afternoon, Chelsea Andrews, president of HOC. Um, and thank you so much for the council's support. Um, the program that we actually um, uh, receive county funding for is our rent supplement program, uh, as well as our move up initiative program, our community choice um, homes initiative and our youth bridge um, initiative. And these are vital programs where we're able to support, of course, individuals who are experiencing housing instability and they all have different subcategories that they focus on our voucher program um, which i believe we also mentioned where we receive um, uh, funding from the federal government is also a program that we use to help provide subsidies um, we continue to um, increase our utilization amongst all of these programs because the need is great as madam um, hong said earlier um, and we continue to work in partnership with HHS um, and at this juncture we do believe that while there is a nominal cut and we understand the reason for it we will be able to maintain our program in a successful manner we we'll just ask the ability to work with HHS uh, as need be um, if ever there are challenges in, in, in um, navigating but we do believe that we'll be able to maintain our programs effectiveness thank you that means a lot Ms. Hong did you want to respond to that and we just continue to appreciate the partnership. Great. And Council Members Mink and Stewart, feel free to chime in at any point if you'd like to. Yes, Council Member Mink. Um, appreciate that. Appreciate the work of everybody at the table for us uh, and of our colleagues on the HHS committee. Um, so just to clarify, um, the program that we're talking about is the the RAP, the RAP Rental Assistance Program. And, and if we're looking at the rental assistance portion of the HIF funding, um, just wanted to clarify that the, that program is directed in particular to, as you were um, mentioning this song, um, to particular parts of the population, right? It's not open to the general population. So just wanted to, could you just clarify that for us? Yes, thank you. So the rental assistance program, it's confusing because we just ended the emergency rental assistance funding, the COVID rent relief program, so multiple names and acronyms. The county's rental assistance program is different. It's a shallow subsidy that's provided to individuals who have disabilities or who are 55 years or older, so older adults um, who may be at imminent risk of homelessness. So it's limited in its scope. And with the budget, so here you have listed about 7.8 million. It's only 4.1 million of that that is dedicated to the county's shallow subsidy program. And that can serve 800 to about 1,200 of our residents. And then in addition to that, what's not listed here is that we use that rental assistance funding to also pay for the rent for um, disabled households through our housing initiative program. So it's, it's, it's not broken out here that way, but that is what we know to be the case for that budget line. Um, so it's distributed across, across multiple programs. Got it, thank you. And so I know later when we get to the ERAP, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which we don't have anymore because that was federally funded, that that touches a much wider bucket of people. And so we'll have a, I'm sure, a robust conversation about how to approach that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions from the committee or, or did you come from the Well, this isn't a question so much as a, of course, this packet is large, right? And and as, as duly noted early on in it, part of the work on these issues that, that deal with um, eviction prevention and, and keeping people housed fall through HHS, and part of it will go through the PHP committee, right? So at no time until we are before the full council, and even then, because the things are kind of broken up by committee assignment, we don't see it all together. And I think 
that we need to. I think that it would be very useful for the council as a whole body to be able to see both those portions that run through PHP and the portions that run through HHS together, not just the budgetary pieces to know what was covered in FY24 and by what source, noting that we have a lot of things that have been funded with federal funding related to the pandemic and then um, now we fund locally or we are or are not continuing to fund, um, but we need to know the criteria for each category. So thank you, Ms. Hong, for explaining just now, like you did, the difference between ERAP and RAP and, and, and to council member makes point, you know, one was a much wider net and one is much more narrow. But I think the council as a whole needs to see that in a format where they can reconcile the disparate pieces all in one, um, you know, especially to the extent that things are adjusting because of changes in time and, and wrap up of certain programs that you that it's useful for us and for the public to understand what we do have, what has always been and what has been added and how it has been refined over time. So if we could do that, that would be really good. Yes, Councilman Stewart. I just want to echo that because <laughs> uh, not serving on HHS, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces here between HHS and uh, DHCA and I think also, um, you know, what, I'll raise two things and I, if they are not appropriate for now, just put a pin in it and <laughs> um, I ask that you think about them. Um, that we hear from um, constituents um, is one, when they're asking for um, assistance through the county, um, again, either through, I think it's through the RAP program or the ERAP, even though I know we don't have funding moving forward. It's um, the, the way that we do it now in terms of that they have to have a summons for the eviction is really difficult and stressful for them. And I know there have been conversations, but I just wanted to bring that here as we're looking at assistance programs. Um, and we do know in our experience that people self-evict because there it's a very complicated system. So, um, you know, that's that's one thing. And then the other thing that that I feel like is on a rise. I don't know if my other colleagues are hearing this from um, folks as well, but is the fact that landlords, even though they're not supposed to, are discriminating based on income and not accepting people. And because we have such a housing shortage, especially an affordable housing shortage, we're hearing more and more stories about that. So I just wanted to bring those two points up today. So they're excellent points. Absolutely hearing the same thing. Agree with a more concise presentation to be able to connect all of the dots. Because so much of that crosses over into our colleagues in PHP, it's not appropriate for us to get too die to dive too deep into that conversation but we do want to acknowledge that our colleagues from DHCA are here um, and so let's revisit that once we get back to full council to have a broader conversation but it brings up a policy issue that we have talked about before in a joint committee session as recently as this fall um, but need to revisit again um, because the information is is continuing to shift in just in real time so but those are excellent points and I didn't because DHCA is here and has to leave did you have any comments that you wanted to make um, before having to leave to go to PHP and there's still more to talk about but at a high level anything that you'd like to respond to and Councilmember Stewart's comments Mr. Bruin. <laughs> Uh, I think they're all, uh, sorry, Scott Bruton, Director of Department of Housing and Community Affairs. I think they're all very valid points. Uh, I do want to give uh, credit to uh, Ms. Hong, uh, or, Dire or Director Hong. Um, she has been working with us and uh, the Office of Human Rights in order to try to uh, more effectively combat source of income discrimination. Um, and we're looking at, I don't want to spill any beans or anything but we're looking we're looking at some different options she's looking she's looking at some different options and providing the leadership on this how to be more effective at and aggressive at preventing that um, yeah Ms. Hong do you have any beans you want to spill <laughs> <laughs> sure we can spill some beans and I, I want to acknowledge um, director Bruton for his expertise so he recommended that Seth 
um, look into the Equal Rights Center in the district who has done um, great work in investigating and doing fair housing testing and has um, helped in prosecuting some of the source of income discrimination that is occurring in the district and we intend to do the same in Montgomery County because it absolutely cannot continue to occur. It impairs the ability of so many families and individuals from exiting homelessness. So it's very important work and um, we're very eager to see that move forward. Councilmember Mike. Thank you. Just um, quick clarification. Of course, the PHP committee is going to go into uh, some of the HIP funding and, and related uh, in, in more detail as has been discussed. Um, a good point. Um, just wanted to make sure I understand, is there another bucket of funding that's not listed in this packet for rental assistance that lives in DHCA, um, but, that is, but that's not uh, mentioned in this packet? Or is it, a, a, I think, my understanding is that it's just a matter of we're not going into a level of depth and, and discussion of some of that, but that it is noted here. Is that accurate for either director? So yes, there, there are about $9.7 million in Housing First funds that also come through DHCA to um, SEF, and those funds are used for a variety of different purposes, including permanent supportive housing and, and other work that SEF does. In that bucket is um, eviction prevention funds. So there are $4.7 million there dedicated to eviction prevention. That will continue on even, you know, even as the ERAP funding is gone now. So it, it's very, that's, that will continue to be an important way in which we prevent evictions. And by having moved the intervention, the point of intervention to court summons, Th though it is not as proactive as we would like to be, um, it, is, it is six times more um, people who receive court summons than receive eviction judgments. So it is a significant increase in the workload of the eviction prevention team. So we, we do need those staff and are very thankful that the county executive funded eight additional staff amongst the ERAP team. But yes, that is the, the bucket of additional bucket of funds that we have. That's the 4.7 million. 4.7 million. That's not, that's not all direct funding. That's um, uh, that is. That, that's, that's not the direct funding. That's not, okay, great. Not costs, yeah. Thank you for the clarification, Dr. I should say there there are uh, in DHCA's budget. There's some additional money uh, for uh, effectively effectively housing instability prevention. Uh, we have some of the rentals, some of the money that comes from the deed and recordation tax goes to DHCA to be used for rental assistance. And we use these for short and long-term contracts to pay the difference between uh, what would make a unit affordable to a household and what the market uh, rent is. We also have uh, 400, four hundred some thousand dollars that the Office of Landlord and Tenant Affairs uses in collaboration uh, with SEF uh, for things such as uh, uh, hotels when people are temporarily displaced or maybe some rental assistance. It's, it's, it's more kind of situational emergency short-term kinds of things to keep people in their homes. Um, yeah. Oh, and I did want to, you had also mentioned, um, uh, Council Member Stewart had also mentioned um, the criteria for getting emergency rental assistance. And I did want to give Director uh, Hong uh, credit for making a change very soon after she took over SEF. And it used to be that um, you needed to have an active writ, uh, which means you're much further down the line and things have gotten much worse before you could get emergency rental assistance. She and her staff very quickly changed that to as soon as you have a filing. So you still have the difficulty of having an eviction filed on you, but it's much better to have it earlier on. And I know that they're evaluating ways that they can, uh, you know, improve that to deal with the kind of impact that an eviction, even an eviction filing can have on people. Great. That's very helpful. It's important context. We'll dive deeper, but that was terrific. Um, so I think maybe colleagues without objection will accept the executive recommendation on this first item of acknowledging it's a small reduction, but yeah. it sounds like we can continue services despite that reduction. Great. Next. Okay. I did want to note that, that for the rapid uh, rehousing, um, that that, fund, that funding in the general funds and HHS budget is $2 million this year, um, 959000 coming from the HIF, and, the and that was a reduction of 500000 
Um, so we, it wasn't really discussed, but I did want to note that's where the biggest reduction came from, um, from the HIF funding for DHHS. Uh, the next item is the FY24 Supplemental for Shelter Services and the FY25 Recommended Operating Budget for the Homeless Services for Single Adults. So this section is all about uh, the shelter services uh, and we are starting with the supplemental because it feeds into uh, that this would need to be ongoing for FY25 if, you, if the council decides to um, support the um, supplemental as presented. On uh, April 2nd, 2024, the council introduced supplemental uh, appropriation uh, for shelter services overflow and security expansion of $1.7 million. Uh, the committee work session is being held prior to the public hearing because of the scheduling constraints. And so any recommendations that you provide here today are tentative. Um, and then we'll hear if anything comes from the public hearing and we can revisit those recommendations at our follow-up if needed. The supplemental funding has four main purposes to approve uh, appropriation for funds that were already spent when the shelter needed to increase capacity during hypothermia season in response to higher numbers of adults seeking emergency shelter and to avoid turning people away. Um, to approve the appropriation to continue funding for year round capacity increases. To increase the funding for the Progress Place Empowerment Funding. Uh, empowerment center, excuse me, and provide funding to start expanded security at certain shelters. Um, and so just as an FYI, it had the funding, the funding was pre-spent um, at, some, at some locations, but the increased security for Neville Street and New Leaf Shelter would not start without approval of the supplemental funding. So, um, Great. Uh, did my colleagues in the executive branch have anything to say about this before we jump in? I, I just want to acknowledge all of our shelter providers. It really was a tough winter. We saw increasing amounts of unsheltered homelessness. You heard re the reports of people sleeping in the crisis center. We were at capacity in our shelters um, before hypothermia season. So when we entered it, we knew that we would struggle. So the shelter partners were all open to expanding the amount of hypothermia shelter that they provided, and um, it, it literally saved lives. So. Um, so important the work they did many of them did that um, paid forward or spent forward their contracts in order to do that so this supplemental is very important in making them whole and also in the FY 25 budget which where there are increases there it will prepare us for this coming um, this coming winter because what I can say preliminarily about the point in time count that occurred in January is we did see a 28% increase in um, those we counted from last year. So we do um, expect the homelessness num homeless numbers to continue to rise. So we need to be prepared so that people are not without options. Thank you, I appreciate that. I did have one question and certainly echo the support and thanks to our shelter providers and in particular the staff um, work is hard on a good day um, and so we really just appreciate their leadership something you intimately are familiar with Ms. Hong. Um, I did have a question regarding safety and security um, we know that this is uh, had been an ongoing issue um, there have been several incidences that have taken place that are troubling um, certainly for the staff but also for the constituents that um, participate in these shelter programs could you talk a little bit about the safety and security issue? There's probably never quite enough money, but from a strategic and system standpoint, how are we supporting our shelter providers on safety and security? Yes, so I know that security is not immediately what we think of when we um, talk about shelter, but it, it is very important because we, we in Montgomery County aim to create a safe space for people to come to, and that is so important. Um, for a vulnerable population, for a marginalized population. The LGBTQ population um, receives so much um, bullying already. We, so um, we need to work hard to create that space which is safe and trauma-informed. Our staff are experts on that in shelter, but they need extra support because we have seen post-pandemic with the behavioral health crisis a rise in violence in all of our shelters, a, a significant increase in um, violent incidents in our shelters. In addition to that, our public safety, our police have, have responded and there has been an increase in calls for service 
by two and threefold to all of the emergency shelter. And it pulls our public safety from the very important work they have to do in the community, our police officers, our um, EMTs. And, and so to have robust security in each shelter is really important. The Neville Street shelter, the largest of our shelters serving um, 200 during hypothermia season, 260 men up to 260 did not have 24 seven security. And so that is one of the things that we've added here, 24 seven security for the Neville Street Emergency Shelter, as well as doubling the amount of security that patrols the surrounding area because there are different incidents that are, had arisen um, surrounding the shelter, also very important. And then in the smaller shelters, well, I can tell you Rainbow Place had no security. And then in the smaller shelters, they only had eight hours a day of security. Um, and we appreciate the council for providing additional funds to provide even that eight hours. So this supplemental um, will increase the security at the smaller shelters to 16 hours a day, which I've spoken to them. They believe that is adequate because um, during the busiest eight hours, that's during typical business hours for us at least, um, nine to five, there are uh, clinical staff present, the shelter director is present, and, and that is adequate to respond to different incidents that may occur. It's really during the after hours, the overnight, that the security is much needed. So um, I hope that answers your question. It does. One follow-up, though. I know that um, it's important to have security firms that we work with that understand this work um, and that are trained in it. Um, and I know that was a point of concern and contention um, a couple of years ago. How are we in that space or the firms that we are working with? Are you confident that they will be able to provide the support necessary because the budget is only half the battle? Yes, very insightful. <laughs> it is a work in progress. So what I can say is there do continue to be concerns with the different contract security companies that we're working with. Um, I, I think, as you mentioned, that training is really key. Um, tr participation in training is not where we want it to be. So, and, and I can tell you that Director Daryl White has been very supportive. We join meetings every two weeks to discuss any security issues coming up. This is uh, focused in at Progress Place and then the regional offices for HHS for Seth. Um, but we will expand that because um, it's not exactly where it needs to be and training uh, needs to be more comprehensive because it's a very specialized population and there are many best practices that our shelter staff have become skilled at, but that security they're still on their learning curve. So you're right, it is not perfect, and, uh, but we are working together collaboratively, both uh, with the partners, um, with our nonprofit partners, with security services, with directly with the different contract security companies. Um, and if that continues, I'm confident that the uh, quality of services will improve. I appreciate that. Ms. Clemens Johnson, if we could revisit this after the budget process is over, maybe sometime after the summer into the fall. Um, and I appreciate your candor uh, in acknowledging a challenging situation. So, um, Councilman Merliki. Thank you. And um, and on that same topic, I know, I know that all of our nonprofit providers have been doing the best they can with what they've had to work with, and it, it has been exceedingly difficult. And I, appreciate that. Um, it's also my understanding that the non-competitive contracts are going out for bid um, and that as our providers put in what they're capable of, of serving uh, the population with that they will have to address security as, a, as an issue, of course, and what their plan is for that. In terms of the county awarding the contract out to them and then them contracting for different security providers within their facilities, Who's going to have ultimate oversight over what is being provided in terms of the security services in those facilities? Yeah, so it's it's a combination of oversight between security services, um, but we know that it's the partners that see everything happen. So oftentimes, and this is also part of the challenge with security services, you have officers there, whether it's contract or county employed, who don't have their management there. So if something happens and it wasn't addressed the way it really needed to be, it's almost always the partners who see it and report it. And that's why those collaborative meetings are really important. 
Um, but it's, it's, I think ultimately we are accountable as county government, as the executive branch, which is why, I mean, I've been in countless meetings with Director Daryl White, because it, it's such an important thing to get right. And when we get it wrong, um, the harm is really to the clients. And we create an environment where people are traumatized. And everyone who saw an incident occur, a violent one, and was not handled as it should have been, is also can also be traumatized and may not want to return. And that is definitely on us. That's our responsibility, which is why Seth continues to join these um, biweekly meetings, because we are very keenly aware of the potential harm that could happen if security is not done the way it needs to be. Um, I should also add, which, which I didn't think of this in the, in the prior question, that um, some of our partners are interested and open to potentially contracting security themselves so that it can be a function of their funding and contracting so that they can direct it because right. they know the best practices. Um, security services, as supportive as they are, um, it's not their job to know all the best practices in providing homeless services. So that, that's another possible avenue we could explore as we see whether our, um, the different security companies rise to where they need to be to provide high quality security services in our shelters. Yeah, I think, I think that that, you know, because the providers are the ones who are the boots on the ground, they're there day in and day out with the people that they are serving. They're the ones who are in the best position to know whether or not a particular security arrangement is or isn't working out. And you know, and I know they have good partnerships with the local law enforcement departments who, who they build relationships with and you know, to the extent that they can help inform that and how to work best um, with, with the folks there, that would be great because you're 100% correct. Each incident causes more people to refrain from availing themselves of, of services when they might need them the most, and, and that's um, not a position we want to be in. So thank you. So if I can just add um, quickly to that. So we're in the process of um, creating the RFPs now um, for, for the shelters. Um, that is absolutely something we can include um, uh, the section about security and what our expectations will be um, for the, the provider, whoever wins the, the, um, the bids to provide a certain level of security, um, a certain level of training for security to, to match what we expect um, from the trauma-informed um, uh, uh, issues that, um, that Ms. Hong brought up, but also um, that, we, that we would expect. There is some um, differences between um, security right now between um, MCCH and um, Interfaith Works just because it's a, they're allowed to do their own thing, um, but there's a huge price discrepancy um, between one and the other. Um, which also then um, potentially leads to um, needing more money for security because one contract is higher than another by like twenty dollars an hour each. So, um, so that that does add. Um, so we, we can also address that through the RFP um, and certainly expect to do so. And I thank you. And then Council Member Stewart sitting here next to me, and I know she and I have spoken about this at, at great length about wanting to have things more standardized for like services, standardized indirect cost rates. Um, put your your same services providers on the same contract cycle so that you're able to address them and evaluate them at the same time in parity with one another and that will be helpful and it also creates um, more collegiality within the provider uh, community as well when everything's standardized. And we do appreciate the council's support in us doing um, uh, bidding um, competitive contracts for this. There may be nonprofits who are not as excited about having to do that. Um, so uh, your, your support is greatly appreciated. Great transition to the chair of our government and operations yeah. committee, yeah. Council Member Stewart. Um, then I've also got Council Member Minkin, the queue followed by Council Member Sales. Great. Well, um, first, um, I was remiss when I started my comments before Director Hong. At first, I, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you've been doing since you've taken over um, in this. Um, you, you know, came into this position when we've seen dwindling federal funds, um, as we've seen historic increases in our unhoused population, not just here in Montgomery County, but in our region. So I appreciate all of your work on this. Um, and as the council member who has both Progress Place and Neville uh, in her district, um, I, you know, I, I'm glad that we are able to um, provide for the providers who stepped up, who said they would meet a need um, and do so, you know, on the promise that the county would <laughs> come back and pay them for it, but th that's that's a lot of trust, and um, we're very lucky to have those providers um, in doing that. 
Um, in addition, just to talk about the security issues, um, that really is a balance. Um, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness that is going into this and working so closely with our partners um, because they absolutely know like what's best um, to care for the people who are coming to their um, the, the shelters who are need their services and it's true that uh, we have um, this housing these shelters in our community and so we also have a responsibility as the county to make sure the people who are there in our entire everyone is safe um, and we do know uh, the calls for service have increased um, from our police department. So I just want to say um, thank you for trying to looking at that balance um, and caring for those people in need and also realizing the responsibility we have as a community. So thank you. Thank you. Councilman. Thank you. Echo that sentiment. Um, wanted to draw just a direct connection between the funding that we need uh, at our shelters, which continues to increase, um, and uh, the means that we have to support our renters who are trying to stay housed. So we're looking at a very serious reduction, obviously, in our direct assistance with the uh, emergency rental assistance funds. Um, it was $14 million in federal funds, um, about $12 million of which I believe um, was for directly assisting residents to stay in their housing. And um, so as a response to that, I, I think you all have been very strategic in focusing on prevention and doing everything uh, that can be done with the funds that remain. Um, but um, as our unhoused population, as you note, has continued to increase, and, um, and as the chair has noted, uh, the stress and strain on our community members uh, is still there, even in the absence of that federal funding. Could you talk a little bit about that relationship between that type of funding, which, and you know, there's a little funding that lives in DHCA, you have pockets of funding in various places, um, but none of that is a replacement for this $14 million that is being lost here. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the relationship between that and our shelter funding? Capacity. Sure. I mean, first to acknowledge our federal government in preventing homelessness from <clears throat> increasing during the pandemic beyond what it had. Um, it was a $120 million investment in Montgomery County, and we actually saw our homeless numbers drop during the pandemic because of that, because of the moratorium. And so we know that resources from the federal government can reduce our homeless numbers. Having said that, it's gone. And we at CEF are working really hard to um, prepare. And our strategy had been that, um, that our emergency rental assistance program staff, they, they were term positions, and that we wanted to repurpose them to do the case management that was needed to equip households to manage their income, to apply for income supports, as well as um, any financial counseling that they might need so that that was our strategy and because the county executive funded eight positions we're eager to embark on that work to do that work um, so that that is in part our strategy as well as being more proactive to the extent we can with the capacity of the staff in identifying those in need of the rental assistance that we have to offer um, so those are all key parts of our strategy um, we wish that we had uh, additional federal resources to provide that rental assistance, but working with what we have, uh, we, we know that we can um, strengthen households that are coming to us. I want to acknowledge the, the very importance of case management. So this is the world that I came from, that when you don't have unlimited resources, our case managers are the engine that creates stability for households. I mean, we would love to um, ensure every family had the income that they needed to n to be housing stable and to never face homelessness, but that is not the reality. So it's our case managers that ensure that um, countless individuals and families, well I can tell you it's a hundred families that they housed just in, in FY24, we're not even at the end of the fiscal year. And of those who are housed in permanent supportive housing, 98% retained their housing. That is the work of our case managers. It is so important. So it's not just providing the rental assistance, it is the support as well. So I'm, I'm very confident in what our, our um, additional aid staff will do 
um, and, and I seek the support of the council to uh, approve that funding because that is our strategy right now. In addition to the 4.7 million that we have to distribute when, when evictions are imminent, that case management piece is key to uh, helping those who are coming to us, those households, to increase their housing stability, to have the resources they need, to increase, um, yeah, increase their access to all the resources in our community, not just what the county has, but what exists outside as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I very much appreciate the work, uh, Director Hung, of trying to figure out how to mitigate the impact of losing those federal dollars uh, and the, the strategy that you and your team have put uh, behind looking at this plan. Um, and wanted to note, you know, you're, you're talking again, this is again, as Chair Albernos mentioned, you're talking about new positions, but in fact, you had far more positions um, funded by federal dollars previously. And so we're looking at being able to retain like less than a third, I think, of those cr positions that were created. So just, is that accurate? There were 28 um, term positions and eight of them will continue. Yeah, that is, that is those yeah. numbers. So I appreciate all of the work that you all are doing to be strategic on um, what is a shoestring budget in this space compared to what we had when we had the federal dollars and uh, appreciate the work of, of the committee here. And I think that this is gonna be a place that we need to have really, really close eyes on um, during the, this budget process, as well as moving forward, because we're talking about striking that right balance. We don't wanna put in um, more direct funds than we need. If we can case manage more people out of needing those funds, of course, that is where we wanna go. But you also need some of those funds in order to be able to case manage those folks out. And so it's about having that right balance and if we don't have enough of uh, one or the other then we're going to end up spending a lot more on shelters and all of the you know the other pieces that um, result when we're not able to meet that balance and so I think it's going to be very important for us to have um, as Councilmember Ludke <laughs> alluded to uh, a really a detailed conversation about what the right balance is of those numbers if we might need to look at the possibility of pulling some funding from other places, whether that's during the budget process or, or after, to meet gaps that, uh, uh, that, that need to be met, um, but appreciate uh, the indications of the committee if they're interested in diving into that further. I think that certainly looking at what we hear from my constituents within District 5, uh, this is a really, really high priority. So thanks very much. Thank you. That's from Sales. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hong. Uh, <coughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hong. So um, looking through the, uh, the budget and the um, decrease, the reduction in funding for rehousing, the lack of staff, um, I know the emergency rental assistance program was so helpful to a lot of our families. And I know that we had um, uh, 20 plus uh, case managers overseeing that program. And I'm just wondering um, what that continuation will look like. Um, it looks like the amount that's uh, being provided uh, will also be lowered, but I'm, I'm trying to understand how many um, of those families that uh, were um, eligible for the emergency uh, resources are going to continue under these uh, newly um, transferred case managers who are going to become permanent staff. Um, what are, what's their caseload going to be? So I'll, I'll provide a response and then my colleague here, Rebecca Sosa, she's the administrator over housing stabilization and she led the team through um, the distribution of all of the COVID rent relief emergency rental assistance fund. So I will pass it to her after I make a response preliminarily. So we, um, we expect that many families, because we see it in our numbers, even after they receive financial assistance, because they're not able to attain housing stability, they, may, they often return to us. So we know that there are, there are households that return, and so we do expect to continue to serve them which is why our strategy is to expand the amount of longer term case management provided. So typically when a housing stabilization worker meets with a household, they, they may work with that household for up to 30 days. In more complex cases, our case managers may work with them for up to 90 days. 
SAF's capacity to provide that case management, however, has been limited to one full-time equivalent per regional office. That's very limited. And so our hope with the, the eight additional staff um, and six of those are clients assistant specialists is that we would send two to each of the regional officers or have two based at each of the three regional officers. So that would be an increase of threefold, three case managers who could potentially be dedicated to serving households on a more long-term basis. Because their cases are often complex, we are seeing them return to us multiple times. And um, we, st we saw that with the COVID rent relief as well, even though we provided a significant um, 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 paid for a significant amount of arrearage, we knew that they, they would still return to us. So that's what our reasoning was for aiming for that longer term case management. And with that, I'll just pass it to Ms. Sosa to see if she has anything she wanted to add as well. Sure, Rebecca Sosa with SEF. Um, what I'd like to add is just the need for that longer term case management. Um, I think Council Member Mink mentioned the case managers would work to ensure that people don't need the funds, um, that they are able to become stable on their own, whether it's through increasing their, um, their work income or accessing other resources in the community. And so that's really the, the tough work that we, that we would like to do. So that's what I, I guess I wanted more clarification on what that roadmap to self-sufficiency looks like. During that case management process, are you, um, discussing uh, uh, financial literacy or connecting them with the Office of Workforce Development. Are there any, um, you know, steps along the way that they are being required or requested to meet as they are continuing to access these? Sure. So uh, within SEF, we do operate with a housing first model. And yes. So there are no requirements that somebody has to meet in order to receive our services or our funding. Um, but each case is unique, and so in terms of a, a roadmap, it, it's varied depending on the needs of the individual. It really is varied. So for many people, it's looking at increasing their income through work. Uh, we have many families that still are not working for various reasons, and so helping them to get the supports they need in order to find work that they can sustain themselves. It can also mean looking within our community or maybe outside of our community for more affordable housing. Um, that's something that was talked about earlier in, in today's session is just the lack of affordable housing. It could mean accessing child support that the spouse hasn't been paying. It could mean applying for um, temporary disability assistance or food stamps. Um, getting good mental health supports in place so that so that the individual can um, maintain a good quality of life. Um, the the resources are really abundant in our community, so it's a matter of our team knowing them, and then helping to provide that warm handoff so that people can access the services and the resources. And how many clients do you think, on average, does each of the case managers have? Um, I think for the longer, for the folks who need to do longer term case management, I think what we had talked about was getting on an average of one case assigned per day so that they can maintain that long term relationship. So over a month time period, they would have 30 clients that they're working with along the way, providing this intense service. For those folks uh, on our team that are, that are processing benefits, their caseloads would be higher. So average 30, but it could be higher. And is that 30 and then they don't get any more for the rest of the month or they are adding 30 every month? They're, they're adding load. 30 every month. So as people are falling off, there's more cases coming. So we don't know what the current average is since the program start for each of those contracted case managers. So our case managers really are just transitioning now and starting to, to do some of that. But this program has been in operation for over a year, right? The ERAP, almost two years. Yeah, so with the ERAP funding, it, it, it was quite intense. And I, I will say, even though so much of the work was trying to ensure um, all the residents in Montgomery County who needed it had access to the ERAP funds, um, so it was a lot of looking at eligibility and then distributing funds. There was um, case management and connection to resources, but it, it was not in depth. And what I can say is that 
Um, best case scenario, each client assistance worker uh, can serve up to 600 individuals per year, or households per year. That's that's if everything goes really well and there aren't crises or you know there aren't staff who are calling out. What we're aiming for with the longer term case management, so going from up to 30 days of working with a household to up to 90 days, is more like an average of 200 households that they would serve. Those those six that I was talking about, that they would serve up to 200 households per year. So it's more focused, it's more comprehensive, uh, but it's rolling too. It's not like they just keep a caseload of, um, like in our shelters, each case manager ideally would have 15 to 18 clients at a time. It doesn't work that way because it's continually, we continue to see demand coming into our offices and we have to meet that demand. So it's it's a goal and to, to get to that goal, we, we need the staff. Okay, and how are you tracking this case manager to client ratio. Is that so we, information you can share with the committee? Yes, we can. Well, we're so we're working on, um, I, I am very well versed in our use of the homeless management information system, as is the CEF data team. When I started at CEF, and I had shared this in November, um, and, and our data manager was brand new when I came to that session, what what I learned is that there there is less um, immersion in the electronic case management system that CEF uses. So the data team is getting up to speed and is working very closely with the um, planning, analytics, customer service team at HHS who are, they actually own this case management database, EICM, and are the administrators and experts in pulling data. So we're working closely with them to be able to access more data to share with you because we want to show the work that we're doing. We're very proud of it and we know that, for example, we have some data that shows we prevent up to 60% of households from entering homelessness. This is in our diversion efforts, which Rebecca's team handles for families. That is, for me, astounding. That's really impressive work. And they do that in addition to all this other work that we've talked about with regard to housing stabilization and eviction, eviction prevention. So it's there. We just have to get to it, and we're working on that. Um, and we appreciate the council's patience on that. But yeah, we can look at what data we have to provide to you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I think without objection, colleagues, we will concur with uh, this particular line item. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, yes, so that covered the FY24 supplemental. The FY25 funding um, for shelter services is $2,865,686 and zero FTEs. This is annualizing the appropriation. Um, and on page, 16, on page six, it details the amount that would go to each provider and the facility. Uh, and council staff recommends approval of the FY25 enhanced funding. Um, just to be clear, this would be included in the new and enhanced program category um, for the uh, committee to consider. Um, I certainly concur with the staff recommendation. Are there any other comments? I'm hearing them, I think without objection. Okay. And the next item is an enhancement of adding three peer support specialists at Interface Works to address behavioral health needs at Progress Place, uh, the shelter in Silver Spring, $207,000 and zero FTEs. Uh, to be clear, these positions are not part of the FY24 supplemental funding. They are new for FY25. Um, DHHS provided um, some details for us on the peer support specialists. Uh, they will be based on site to engage, build rapport, and form trusting relationships with the increased number of individuals who are um, experiencing homelessness at Progress Place. So most of these individuals are identified as needing some or having some form of behavioral health condition and needing some level of intervention while they are at Progress Place. Uh, we just wanted to be clear there were no peer support specialists specifically dedicated to Progress Place in FY24. However, there is, sick, there is a contract with Tree of Hope for 250000 to provide peer support, um, peer support services amongst the six emergency shelters for individuals and many of the permanent support and housing programs. 
um, but those services are not adequate um, based on the ongoing need at Progress Place. So um, council staff recommends approval. Um, if, rec if approved, this would go on the new and enhanced program category. There's absolutely a need for this. I certainly concur with the recommendation. I did have one question on recruitment, Director Hong, so that remains a challenge, uh, both retention and recruitment. Um, what strategies are we utilizing or do you anticipate utilizing to fill these particular positions? Yeah, so we, we will um, empower Interfaith Works to take the lead on recruitment. They know best the um, both the population they they actually have a long history of hiring peers so I, I don't I, I don't think they'll be challenged in identifying peers I think that training will need to be a partnership though with the county because it's both um, behavioral health and crisis services and tree of hope who have all the training available so I, I think it will be a, a really nice way for the partnership between those entities to grow closer. Um, the key for the success of these peers is they have to be embedded at Progress Place. It can't be they're visiting like three or four times a week. They have to be there the entire day because that's how you get to know the population there. It's spending time with them when they're having um, meals at Shepherd's Table, when they're hanging out in the parking lot. And our providers there at Progress Place are experts at that. So I, I'm very optimistic that these three peers will do will have a huge impact on what's been happening there and just improve the capacity of that team to build trust with those they're serving there and then ultimately connect them to resources and housing is what we want to see. Councilmember Luki, followed by Councilmember Stewart. Just want to clarify, so you, you're saying the entire ecosystem there at Progress Place because it isn't all, you know, some people stay there, mm -hmm. some people come in and out for mm -hmm. Shepherd's Table. We have a whole lot going on there. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a whole ecosystem, but that the peer support specialists would be able to assist with anyone walking through the doors for whatever purpose they're walking through the doors, correct? Yes, yes. absolutely, because it, it is an ecosystem, and as you said, and people will receive services where they want to. They may receive meals and shelter, um, or they may just, some of, there are a number of residents um, on the fourth floor, but some may just come for vocational services or to see um, Dr. Kelly's team there, and we want engagement to just be across the board because it is, it's just a very large collaboration and we want to engage everyone who's coming there. Thank you, I really appreciate that because again, they know who comes through their doors, they know why they're coming, they have relationships with them and then especially by having these peer support specialists in place, better able to address those needs um, in, in a different de-escalated fashion, so thank you. We've got Councilmember Stewart followed by Councilmember Sales. Great, I just, I just wanna say thank you to the committee um, and uh, again to Director Hong and to uh, Interfaith Works and everyone at Progress Place. This is so incredibly needed. Um, one, seeing what they're doing now with the peer-to-peer -peer supports. Um, as Director Hong mentioned, IW has a history of hiring peers. There are volunteers there, and when you go to the community today or you spend a day there, you see how impactful they are. And so having three peer support specialists who are there, and uh, it is an ecosystem. It's, it's, a, it's a mini city inside of our city in our downtown in Silver Spring, and I think having the support is gonna make a world of difference for um, the folks who are there, but also for our entire community there. So um, I know I probably shouldn't show my hand so early in our budget process, but I am pleading with my colleagues that this is like one of my uh, at least top three or top five uh, things that I wanna make sure gets into our budget this year. So thank you. Absolutely, Council Member Sales. Um, so I wanted to find out more about the uh, peer support specialists. Uh, how many are at each of these uh, locations, are they are contracted with a uh, tree of hope, and how many different, um, I guess, shelters are they rotating through? Sure. So it's done by referral. So if a case manager at any of the emergency shelters makes a referral for a client to Tree of Hope, then Tree of Hope will work with them. They'll come to the shelter. So it's visiting the shelter when they have meetings. They're not based at the shelters, but um, a very valuable resource because. We all know that homelessness is traumatizing. I've said this many times, but um, the support of a peer, someone who's been through it, is you can't 
put a value on that. Um, and all I would want to see happen is, and this is, you know, for the future for us to look at, is to expand it uh, because it's needed at every shelter. Um, it's needed with our street outreach. We have peers already with our ACT teams, uh, but particularly at Progress Place, th there was an increase, um, well, I should I shouldn't go straight to the increase in violence, but there was an increase in violence. Um, and that is a sign that people are not feeling supported and are not engaged in the services they need. Um, and we know that it's peers who are the best, to, who are the most effective at engagement. And um, that's why it's, it's so important that we invest in peers that are embedded there at Progress Place. But it, it, it is also a support. Oh, okay. Highlighting the importance of this topic. <laughs> 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 I, know. I was going to ask about the hypothermia earlier, but I know we're going to hit that on another session. Do we know what sort of training or credentials these uh, peer support specialists obtain? So there is a whole certification process that is regulated by the state to become a peer support specialist. The, both Tree of Hope and Behavioral Health and Crisis Services are part of that and offer those trainings, which is why that partnership I mentioned with those entities will be so important for these three peers to be effective and um, certified, well-trained in, in what they intend to do there. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I think... Um, Let's hope we can replicate this in other programs, but there clearly is a need here now, so I think without objection, we will accept this recommendation. Um, and the last item for the homelesses, Homeless Services for Single Adults section is the elimination of the Emergency Housing Program Grant of $2.6 million. Um, so this was a one-time grant that DHHS used to purchase certain items for the shelter. Without objection. Okay, so that ends that section of um, of the budget review under SEF. Uh, if you'll see, we went kind of back to reorganizing ourselves after we talked about rental assistance and, and shelter services. Uh, we have our chart here of the new enhanced programs, the potential reductions, and we'll continue to move through um, the packet. So we, uh, council staff requested an update on data analytics, which you all kind of alluded to earlier. Um, during the November 2023 session with the HHS committee, the committee asked about how data systems were coordinated in SEFT. And they were talking about that their new staff person had come on board. So they gave us a brief update on that. That person is getting on board, training, um, and um, SEFT talked about the type of data that they would be able to provide, but they also did mention that, um, that, that, that SEF can report robust data about homelessness, but much so less on its prevention work. Uh, so that was noted. And uh, one thing that SEF said they're working on is entering into a data sharing agreement with the Sheriff's Office to be able to collect more detailed data on households at risk of, eviction, of evictions that are served by SEF and have received court summons and um, judgments. I believe they said that was like a paper process right now. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the next section will discussing FTE and position changes. Uh, the total FTEs for SEF are recommended to be reduced by two FTEs for FY25. This budget change shows that the end of the, uh, the federal ERAP funds uh, was show, results in the elimination of 28 positions. Um, but that meant, uh, but however, that shows a, a two change. <laughs> However, two changes mean that the net change to the FTEs for FY25 was, um, excuse me if that's confusing. There is a recommendation that the FTEs be reduced by two FTEs. The 28 FTEs of, F of ERAP were eliminated, so that that means that there are 26 FTEs proposed for FY25. So there, in general, there was not a large reduction of FTEs, but most of that was the ERAP positions. The table on the following position, uh, on the following page shows positions that have been converted during FY24 from contractor broker services to merit positions. 
So contractors through the broker contracts do not have a specific time limit, but they have uh, might have been doing duties for some time, and now the job must shift to being performed by a merit employee. Uh, since this work by, has been done by a broker contract, an, F an FTE is not being shown in the budget. So this work has been done, it has continued, but now these positions need to, these uh, temporary positions need to become merit. Um, so these FTEs, the converted ones are 18 positions, plus the new uh, eight positions, total 26, are offset by the reduction of the 28 to FTEs, reduct, resulting in the net reduction of two. The eight new positions will be reviewed in the discussion of the prevention program. So, a little confusing, <laughs> but hopefully this chart on the next page provides some clarification. I did wanna talk about vacancies real quick. As of April 5th, there were 29 vacant positions in CEF. Nine of these vacant positions were the ERAP positions, and those vacant those those vacant positions will be eliminated at the end of the year. Um, so only two of the positions have been vacant for more than one year. So that just shows there's been a constant flow of hiring and leaving. So that um, is it for the update on um, the FTEs. Thanks, uh, Director Hung. Obviously, we we're continuing to try to make a dollar out of 75 cents or less but um, just if you could talk a little bit about the personnel situation um, just any overview or thoughts you could provide on that okay I'll start and then uh, my colleague here will jump in so yeah I, I can say that we like our partners in behavioral health and crisis services continue to have difficulty recruiting in particular social workers so um, the vacancies that have been open the longest have been social work positions and for some of them where we can we have been reclassifying them so that we're not requiring a social work license um, but in general we have been able to fill positions like our client assistance specialists um, as long as they are not requiring a license but um, yeah it's been challenging to operate without all of our staff needed and so we're hopeful that if we reclassify some of the vacant positions that we'll be able to recruit and fill them. And I will also pass it to my colleague here too. So one of the things we've been looking at is um, when there were plenty of plentiful amounts of social workers and nurses, for example, we were able to kind of um, look at the higher degrees uh, and, and hire them um, for the best bang for our buck kind of thing. But, as those numbers have dwindled, um, we're looking for um, ways to continue to hire nurses and um, social workers who may not have the same level of education. So bachelors of social work um, prepared um, individuals um, where it makes the most sense. So we wouldn't put um, a bachelor's degree um, social worker in a place where they really do need a, a master's degree. So looking at, at, at those differences, kind of the, uh, the comparison to a um, bachelor's prepared nurse versus an associate's prepared nurse. So um, in, a, in a place where, um, where we were able to say we're only hiring bachelor's prepared nurses, um, that's just not feasible anymore. And so we need to kind of open up the pool. Um, so we're doing the same thing with, with nurses and social workers that looking for potentially a lesser degree, um, but are still um, able to do the work that's required of those positions. And so um, also looking at um, where there have been social worker three positions, um, which is which is part of the, the education in, in, in licensing um, to reclassify those down to social worker twos, which are a little high, easier to hire right now. Um, and so that, that's part of the, the, our plan is to look at the positions um, where it makes most sense to, to lower the, the, the requirements um, so we can get those positions filled. Thank you, and I know we're also looking at salary and compensation, and um, we're, we're looking at a number of areas we're also taking a long view. I know Dr. Bridgers has discussed working closely hand in hand with the Office of Human Resources and partnering with both Montgomery College as well as University of Shady Grove. So. There is a light at the end of this tunnel. We are not alone. Uh, this is hitting every sector of the, this space, um, and uh, we will continue to plug away. Thank you for that update. Uh, I don't have any uh, other questions or comments, so I think without objection, we'll accept that recommendation as well. Okay. The next item is psychiatric services and shelters previously funded by, by grant. This was $300,000. Council staff recommends approval. This will continue the current level of service um, that is provided. Okay, without objection. Okay. Oh, sorry about that, Councilmember Sales. 
Yes, um, so it looks like there's going to be an increase in services, and I'm just wondering, um, do we know how many um, staff or how many hours this will account for? Because it looks like there's, what, 30 psychiatric emergencies on a weekly basis across the five shelters. And I'm just wondering if this $300,000 request will suffice or if we need to request an increase to this budget line item. And don't know how long this service has been used. Um, if we have any track record of have we exceeded this $300,000 or not used all of the money previously just to ensure we're asking for the appropriate amount. Sure, so um, we support this amount because it replaces the grant funds that had allowed, so it's Dr. Burroughs of Urban Behavioral Associates who's been working with Seth for a number of years and she goes on site and she provides direct psychiatric services, offers it. There's, there's also um, a component related um, I'm sorry, a component related to engagement with our healthcare for the homeless team. So we have a psychiatric nurse practitioner who goes in first and you know engages with all the clients and then she will make referrals to Dr. Burroughs to optimize her time. Yeah, yeah, yes, and that's worked really well. Um, so we, we, we are very pleased at this amount. Um, we are also in the midst of a behavioral health crisis, just mindful of that, um, but we, we want to support Dr. Burroughs with this funding and um, continue to see what needs there are in the future. Okay, if you can keep us apprised of the ongoing needs and this exceeds the allotted amount. Thank you. Thank you. So then with that, good question, but without objection then? Okay, the next item is the overflow sheltering in motels. This is one time only uh, item for 2.5 million. Um, so we just wanna note that while this says restore, it is providing the same level of funding for motel sh sheltering as was approved in FY24. Um, the base amount in DHHS is $800,000. Um, that is considered ongoing for overflow sheltering. And this plus this one time together, this would be $3.4 million to support, um, to, to, to support the overflow sheltering. Uh, so DHHS noted that prior to COVID, motel overflow was designated for families with minor children only. With COVID and isolation requirements, individuals were added to the motels and were regularly used during that time. Um, and there was ARPA funding that we utilized as well in those previous years. Um, so CEF is making every effort now to resort back to families only, only utilizing motels except for isolated cases due to COVID-19 in infections. Um, so in effect, moving forward in FY25, the motels will be serving servicing mostly women with children, which falls under family overflow shelter. So um, we did know in the note that Seth consulted with uh, public health in developing their new policies for the overflow sheltering, and public health recommended that congregate shelters continue to utilize um, hotels for isolation just to, um, in addition, they also recommended the use of hotels for isolation of individuals with any severe systems, uh, symptoms of respiratory illness like flu and RSV to protect um, those, the others that are at the sh in the shelter. Uh, council staff recommendation was splitting this funding and identifying 500,000 as a potential reduction. Uh, we noted that the number of homeless families with children increased between 2022 and 2023, but there was there's just really not a good way of knowing how many would be needed to be placed into a motel or need isolation due to illness. Uh, council staff, uh, we did mention that we found the un one time only categor categorization um, concerning because it's unlikely that $800,000 is a significant, uh, is a sufficient base. Um, so our thoughts were that we should have a sufficient base and then, you know, if there are funds that need to be added that the uh, DHHS come back to council over the course of the year. That were our thoughts and, and recommendations. But um, the council process, uh, oh yeah. So, but we did wanna identify that um, the council process does not provide um, the opportunity for switching funding classifications. So instead of this 2.5 or 2.4 million being one time, we don't really have a way of moving it to the base. So um, 
we did want to note that. So, um, and we also did want to consider the $500,000 to be used in the prevention category. Um, so it would shift those funds for um, some direct rental assistance, but we can talk about that in detail in the next item. So in general, recommendation that the, um, that the 2.5 million be reduced to 2 million, um, that the committee could re revisit it during the fiscal year if um, more money was needed for sheltering. Thank you, Ms. Clemens Johnson. I do have a couple of questions. I'm sure colleagues do as well. So, um, Director Hong, if you could provide some context. Um, Ms. Clemens Johnson mentioned as the world changed rapidly during COVID, we're now transitioning back to a pre COVID time. We know our unhoused population continues to increase. We also know that in addition to families, our aging population is also uh, uh, representing a much higher percentage of who we are treating and working with um, and so there are other vulnerable populations and I know this um, th this is a last resort this is not a th the best way of going about doing this work but it's a necessary tool in certain circumstances but could you just from a broad perspective um, shed some light on where you all are what you're seeing and then your thoughts on the staff recommendation Thank you, yes, and I want to acknowledge that my colleague Denise Anderson has joined us. She uh, manages the entire uh, amount of family work that we do in staff, including um, use of, hotel, of the hotels for overflow shelter for families, so she's here with me. Um, and and I, I first have to say um, that as, as much as we are uncertain of what, where the numbers will go on, on, you know, from month to month, we can say that family homelessness is increasing, as indicated by our most recent point in time count. Earlier I mentioned that overall we saw a 28% increase in homelessness. For families, we, fought, we saw a 47% increase. So that is a clear indication that we need to be able to serve those families as they arrive. And we in Montgomery County pledged that minor children will not spend a night outside and so we have to be prepared with our motel capacity to support them. I can also say that this year, this fiscal year, we served an average of 63 families in hotels on any given night. Um, if you cost that out, 63 families, uh, and that costs about $100 a night per family, and for larger families, we, will, we need to shelter them in more than one room. So I average that to 68 motel rooms for 365 nights. That's $2,482,000 right there just for those families. That does not include isolation for COVID, and it doesn't include for individuals who are vulnerable, vulnerable some of whom we place in motels when congregate shelter does not work for them. So I, I have to say, I know you, you didn't want me to get straight to um, my perspective on the recommendation, but I do not recommend that for Montgomery County. We cannot leave our families outside. And if we don't have an adequate budget, that is what will happen surely for some of them. So I strongly urge the council to keep the funding where it is. Um, the county executive and Seth talked very carefully about what was needed to provide adequate overflow shelter, and that's how we arrived at the number. So I just urge the council to um, consider that. Thank you, I appreciate that feedback, and I very much respect the understandable attempt to try and find savings wherever we can find them, and then revisit as necessary. In this case, I concur with the executive branch, um, you know, given the needs and the point in time count that was recently shared. Um, but did you want to add anything? Um, Denise Anderson with the county. I just want to second what Ms. Hong said uh, and also just state for the record that this county currently has 27 rooms available for homeless families across three family shelters. So when you look at our numbers and consider that at any given time, we have uh, definitely over 27 families that are currently homeless. Right now we have, I think, 92 as of the end of um, March. So all of those families over 27 are currently being sheltered in overflow motel. If we do not have access to that, then we're looking at a situation where we won't be able to meet the needs of families that are presenting homeless. In addition, we still have a very robust diversion system for families where we are 
in essence, helping families to use their own resources to self-divert out of the homeless system for about 60% of those presenting. So we're looking at just a portion of the people that are coming in seeking our assistance. Thanks, Ms. Anderson. So um, thank you for, for the explanations. And I note that the figure that was just for the families is almost the entire um, one time only amount that would have included the isolation numbers as well. And I guess I'm curious why, since that's not a one time only and it is an ongoing expense and you've got predictable numbers of the total number of families and rooms needed to meet this need, why was that not in the base budget? I can answer that. I think the the reason is we're still trying to get the information instead of committing to a for sure number for this year um, with uh, the rapidly changing uh, recommendations by the CDC and for the sheltering. Um, it is not that I don't think the executive expects it to only be 800,000, but because it's an unknown number, um, the decision was to put it as one time only again for this year while we try to get the, um, the actual amounts and then come back the following year with a, a more permanent, this is what we think the bottom line is, whether it's higher or lower than this amount going forward. Um, but that is the reasoning. Yeah, I mean, I certainly well said need that you need to do this not just for COVID, right? So for flu or for RSV, which frankly, both of them at this point I'm <laughs> equally not a fan of um, and having had kids who've had RSV it's not fun um, but but it, it seems like we should have a better way already to wrap around like an average of time an average of things that are going to be needed for the public health piece of this as opposed to knowing you know the the separate number where we're we're serving families um, because they're not going to be in the shelter and we do need the extra space in the, in the motels. Uh, Earl Snyder, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. I wanted to add too as well, we talked about this. Uh, hoteling is a terribly inefficient way for us to do this. Mm -hmm. so what we're looking at is finding ways that we can do this outside of the, out, the hoteling environment as well. So I've actually been having conversations with Council Member Stewart about creating incentives for landlords to take on more homeless mm -hmm. clients. We know that two and three bedroom apartments are also a great deficit we have in the county, but we need to free up more of them for, for, for families who are um, in, in, at risk of homelessness so we can actually keep more of them home to hopefully reduce that 63 number down to a more manageable situation. So right. as was alluded to, I think we're trying to work on other strategies to address this because frankly, the hotel, it's not a good use mm -hmm. of taxpayer dollars over the long run. So we've got to free up other avenues that are more efficient use of our funds and frankly, better serve our clients because yeah. an apartment is obviously a yeah. much more stable environment than a hotel is going to be. So I think I wanted to just say that the reason why we include this is one time is because we don't want to view this as a long-term viable way for us to do business because it's not. Would it be possible for us to get an update on that with a projected plan prior to next budget season so that you know as instead of just getting what the I think I think having a, a committee session at HHS talking through that and what's the plan moving forward would be a really good idea okay thank you we can add that we do an annual update with Seth before yep. in the mid mid year so we'll, we'll absolutely make sure that's included uh, Councilmember Sales thank you um, so I know uh, we'll be looking at a more stable and predictable number, but um, what criteria did we use to uh, recommend this reduction, this number? The, what what uh, criteria did you use to recommend the $500,000 reduction, potential? Okay. 
And did we look at trends over the past five years for what we were spending on average for this program every year before we made that? It was just a blanket. I don't believe we had the data on the expenditures. So like last year, we su supported this for $770,000 in one-time funding. Um, that was COVID, COVID mm -hmm. funds that we had. Okay. And so, um, I, yeah, I, I just don't think we had the expenditures. Um, for the last five years? No, it hasn't last been. Last year, there was two pots of one-time only money, COVID and mm -hmm. shelters, and this is sort of combined. So I, I believe the one-time. Uh, this person, yeah, it was 770000 last year of COVID sheltering under. And then there was, I think, $2 million of other, right? I thought it was one. Lambert, Office of Management and Budget. I think it's what $1.5 in one tranche and the 770000 in the other pot of money. Yeah. So it was over $2 million. Okay, we can get the numbers. I don't feel comfortable supporting this reduction, um, not knowing the um, past a few years average. And if we look at five years, that would be before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and a little um, after. So if we can get those numbers before we um, go with the staff recommendation. Thank you. Could, I mean, I, I sure, um, let's come back to it um, before we close out HHS's committee recommendations. But um, I think we're leading in the direction of not accepting the staff recommendation, but we should have all the information before we make that call. Okay, we'll follow up on the 29th. Perfect. All right, next. Okay, next item. Um, this would be enhancement of prevention services due to discontinuation of the Federal Emergency Rental Assistance Program. 841,000 added to the budget in F eight FTEs. Um, so this is funding recommended under the prevention services. The total recommended budget for prevention services is 13.4 million in 69 FTEs, including these new positions. Uh, prevention, prevention services not, not only includes short-term direct assistance with security deposit and rent, but also utility assistance and case management to help prevent evictions and create a more stable housing plan for the household. So these additional positions are recommended so that the DHHS case managers can work longer with clients to find ways to prevent evictions and stabilize their housing situation. As um, Ms. Hong highlighted, this would, um, they traditionally work with clients for 30 days, and this would uh, lengthen the time that they work with clients and, create, and have more interventions with them directly. Um, so council staff provided a few bullets of recommended com uh, discussion or clarity that to receive from DHHS, um, specifically how this operational shift will be managed. Um, our, our thoughts are, but we don't know that that you know that there was prevention work that was happening with the ERAP, but it's unclear how these positions will be specifically used, what this new program model will look like. It will be a change within DHHS um, and their approach. So council staff recommends approving four of the eight new positions. Um, four new positions is a substantial increase to, to test this shift in approach, um, we believe. Uh, the HHS committee should ask for an update um, on the number of people from July 1st through September 30th that has sought prevention services, whether the eviction was prevented, how much county aid was used, and what other source of financial assistance people were able to access with help from the case management services. Um, and uh, and uh, due to our prior recommendation, we ask that the co committee consider adding two items of 250000 each to increase the amount of direct financial aid available in the prevention program. So at the maximum of 3000 in prevention assistance, um, that 500,000 could potentially assist 166 households. If the committee makes this recommendation and this and the recommendation in the prevention program would be considered as new and enhanced. Thank you for that recommendation. I know a lot of people have lost sleep um, over the loss of the Federal Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Um, and it's just been devastating uh, because so many people, it was a lifeline and a bridge. Um, and unfortunately for too many people, not a temporary one. Um, Director Hong, I'll give you the opportunity to respond and uh, get your thoughts. Again, appreciate and respect Ms. Clements Johnson uh, trying to identify areas that we may be able to scale back so that we can address the other myriad of needs that we have. But 
um, we know this work is important and we want to give the opportunity to respond. Thank you. So, so the work of um, CEF is, is both responding to the crisis, but it's also preventing the crisis from continuing to grow. Coming out of the pandemic, we, we are in unprecedented times um, in supporting households from returning to greater housing stability. And we expect to continue to see the need for our case management support, the rental assistance, um, ongoing because families are still strugg struggling to recover from the pandemic. And this is something that uh, Ms. Anderson wanted to point out. So I'm pointing that out here because um, it's really important to note that when we talk about both the need for additional rental assistance funds, but also the staff power to support all of those households. Earlier I had mentioned and Director Bruton had referenced how it was really important for us to be more proactive in preventing households from entering into a housing crisis. We haven't moved as far upstream as we would like to, but we have moved further upstream to get to buy more time for those families to not go to eviction judgment where possible. Because once you um, have an eviction judgment, it's, it's on your credit and it makes it all the more difficult to, to gain housing in the future. So that was a very important step for us. Um, and as I mentioned, that increases the demand for our services sixfold. So it's 7,135 that receive eviction judgments. It's 44,000 that receive court summons for late rent. The rental assistance is in extremely important to pay off their arrearages when we can. I will say that the county cap is $3,000. So there are limitations on what we can do. It is also important to have the staff to respond to the demand we're seeing. I also mentioned earlier that at all three regional offices, we have seen a doubling of demand for our housing stabilization services, two times where we were last year. We cannot meet with all of those households if we cut our staff. Um, so again, I urge the council to approve the eight um, client, the, the eight staff for our prevention work to, to move forward with where we are. I completely understand and want us to have more rental assistance funds and I appreciate the recommendation to identify more funds. I just don't want to impair our ability to do the vital work we are doing now and have strategized to do to reduce the number of households that even need our ev eviction prevention work. So that, that's where I am, but I did want to pass it to my colleague, Ms. Sosa, to see if she had anything more to add. Yeah, um, just a, a couple of questions. Um, so that's for a complete annualized FTE, the 841. That would be to start on July 1st? Okay. The practical reality is these positions are not likely all going to start on July 1st. Or no, they're already there. Okay, they're already there. I got it. Important point. <laughs> so um, we... I, I again understand and respect the staff recommendation, but I just um, I think Director Hong makes a really compelling argument here. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? I have a quick question, um, and, and thank you. And I know sometimes the amount of arrears far exceeds the amount of assistance you can give, right? Um, but I, you know, in knowing how long sort of we've been in a cycle where things have been escalating and ratcheting up. Um, so there's the f filing of the cases, for, you know, like that you may be evicted, which of course is as anxiety provo provoking as anyone can imagine. But um, the where you would lose your right of redemption on that is, do you have to have three of those initial complaints filed per calendar year, or must you have had three judgments for eviction? Because those are two very different things. Yeah, I wonder if my colleagues at DHCA are still here. I understand it's at the fourth where you you can um, where the judge can say there is no right of redemption. Right. Um, but I don't know if it's at eviction judgment or if it's when they if they've received um, a total on the fourth summons for late rent. Right. Anyone? 
I don't know either. I know three is the number, but I don't, I, I don't know. And I was sitting here, and I'm, you know, and, and I think we're all trying to think about again, and, and to your credit, the prevention side, and how do we get to that? Because if it's happening that many times in one year, we're we're not addressing something else that's that's there that isn't being dealt with. Um, and you know, then when you lose the right to redemption, what do you do? Yeah, that's that's when we take the unfortunate course of action to rehouse the family, and right. we are we have the resources to do that. We do that when we we need to, but that of course is traumatizing. That's right. not what we want to see yeah. happen. So we all the more reason why we we need to keep moving upstream. And I say keep moving because that is Seth's strategy. We're not there yet, but we we want to keep moving upstream. Um, but that needs an investment of resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to add to that, if I, if I may. So one of the other things that our team does is we do engage with landlords as well, if, if the tenant allows, and we try to work out agreements. And so there are cases where we've been able to work out an agreement that the landlord cancels that, that final eviction. Um, so that is really important for our staff to be able to engage with landlords as well, not just with our tenants, but um, to, to help with right. the process. And I'm assuming that's stuff like working out a payment plan. Hey, we hear you. We know you filed this. This is what's going on. These are the things that are here in place now to help with the situation. And we'd like you to work with us. And thank you for that because that's incredibly important. Yeah, and, and very often um, if, if a landlord is willing to consider it, we do um, assist in finding funds to pay off the, the, the total arrears balance. That way there's not a problem going forward. The, the tenant is able to start fresh. And do those funds come from county funds, or do they come from elsewhere? From county funds, uh, and we also have some community community partners that we that we um, go to when we need additional funds. So it's a variety. Um, if if we can keep people housed, we try to do it. We do make occasional exceptions to the limits that we're able to provide, uh, but we look at each of those cases on a case by case basis, and and. The ideal uh, that we strive for is that the, the household is able to continue to pay their rent going forward. Right. That is right. really what we need to see, is that they can pay their rent going forward. Right. Thank you. All right. Um, so I think we will go with the executive branch's recommendation on this one without objection, colleagues. Okay. Great. Moving on. And the last item was just was the elimination of the EREP funds, 14 million and 28 FTEs um, in terms of budget. And for the next session, section, um, oh, Councilmember Mick wanted to make a comment. Thanks. I wasn't sure whether I should comment on this, you know, during this the last portion or this one. Are obviously very closely tied together, but just um, noting that I know that you all are balancing, obviously. Uh, between the direct funding and, and the case managing, completely trust your judgment on what the appropriate balance is there, and, and appreciate the um, the committee approving uh, the county executive's recommendation, and um, but also noting that you are working within a framework of an amount of funding, and if we're trying to do uh, to be as efficient as possible to do the work we've been talking about of keeping people housed, as has been said many times in many different ways here, that is the most efficient. That's the most uh, humane um, that's the most fiscally responsible uh, way to approach this work and so just wanted to appreciate again I think <clears throat> Councilmember Lukey's very astute point that getting a really clear picture of where those direct dollars um, lie uh, in the different departments and and how that works and whether and now this would not be on you obviously to request at this point this would be a council discussion but whether it makes more sense in terms of uh, efficiencies to just have more funding in that space. Obviously, $14 million is a huge, huge cut that you all are, are working within, and whether it would be uh, more fiscally prudent of us um, uh, weighing the costs, again, of uh, prevention, of um, the benefits of being able to provide direct aid against the cost of shelters and all the other costs that come along with um, supporting unhoused folks and trying to get them rehoused again if it would make sense for us to to try to look for uh, additional funding that we could move into that space so appreciate where the conversation has gone and thank you all for your recommendation and I see your finger on the button. 
Yes, I, I appreciate you all considering that. It, it's clear in data that spending money on prevention really saves money in the long run. Um, children are able to go to school and be successful in school. Uh, families remain stable in work. There's a lot of benefit to, to keeping people housed. So thank you for considering that. Thank you. I appreciate that, Councilmember Macon. There's a lot of parallels with our food security initiative and programs. Um, with this one in, in particular, it's something we will clearly keep an eye on. I think that you know we, we will also track to see how the prevention side is going. And it goes without saying, if we don't meet the objectives that we would like to strive for, we can't. The alternative is awful, uh, and so we'll have to look throughout the year, as we always do, um, if, if something is needed in a supplement. All right, um, let's move on to the next item. Yes, so lastly, we are including in the packet an update about the utility assistance. This was discussed during the November 2nd HHS committee with SEF and part of the work that they do in, um, in, in their um, service area. Uh, so this was is providing an update on the Maryland Energy Assistance Program and the federal low-income housing uh, home energy assistance and the electrical electric universal service program there is no committee recommendation needed on this item we just wanted to highlight the numbers of those of the applications received and data that they provided um, DHH has said that um, the that the benefits from I'll just call them MEEP and USIP benefits have actually reduced from last year to this year. If a customer is eligible for arrears, they can receive up to two thousand dollars for both gas and electric, and that is an ongoing rule. Um, the department is unable to estimate how many reach the maximum as benefits are calculated in the state system and not um, provided to uh, DHHS and based on a number of household factors. Um, so while DHHS has seen an increase in application intake, the benefits have reduced this program year and the anticipation is a similar expenditures for FY23 um, for FY24. And it's difficult to project expenditures for FY25, but they expect similar spending to FY23. And um, thank you to the SEF team for providing the update. Great, thank you for that. Great. Uh, thank you all very much. Appreciate you, Director Hong. Great job. Lots to cover. And there is one item we will revisit before we make our full recommendation with full council. So thank you. All right. That takes us to the next item on our agenda. transition happen. Thank you, Direct uh, Councilmember Stewart and <laughs> Councilmember Mink, uh, both of you for being here and your support. All right, Ms. Clemens Johnson, you want to tee the next one up?
it is um, rec uh, those recommendations will be forwarded to the council president so the council can consider them uh, across departmental issues. Um, there, there's other contracts and like police and a few other service areas where um, this 3%, where any inflationary adjustment would be applied to those contracts as well. So I have a, I'm sure colleagues have other comments as well. So let me begin with the obvious and just stating our deepest appreciation to our nonprofit sector for their continued leadership. Um, they have just been extraordinary partners and extension of us in county government. We are all very much on the same team, serving the same clients, and uh, I continue to be blown away and impressed uh, by the infrastructure of support that we have in our community and the caring and love that these organizations show to the residents that they serve. Um, we were able to last year uh, increase, uh, as, as well as the year before, just slightly over what the county executive had recommended um, as sort of part of the base. And I have heard from colleagues, you all probably have as well, that we often hear individually from nonprofit organizations who come to us with very legitimate and very real uh, and very raw needs. Uh, and unfortunately, it's, it's, it's difficult um, to be able to pick and choose um, because there is so much need and each of these organizations do such great work. And so I greatly respect that the county executive has recognized um, the need for there to be an across the board inflationary increase, but I'll note that um, it still falls short of what the county is proposing to pay our own staff uh, in recognition of the increases that have impacted county employees. And so what I'd like to propose for discussion, um, colleagues, is that we consider an additional, in addition to the 3%, we also consider so that it can be a discussion point, may not succeed, but as an option for colleagues who, for example, have an individual nonprofit that they'd like to support, but at sometimes the, the, the concern raised by other colleagues is we need to be fair and equitable, um, that we consider uh, a second tranche of 2% on top of the three. Um, it could be another three, it could be one. Uh, I'm splitting the difference here just to get the conversation going. And we may just go with the executive's recommendation, but I wanted it open up for discussion as we did last year as well. So with that, I will uh, ask Mr. Hodge to make some just general comments about this particular line item, why the 3%, why not higher, uh, recommended by the executive, and then yield to colleagues to make any questions or comments. So the 3% the is, is uh, a number that we've offered for many years um, for all of our nonprofits. Uh, council has increased it in certain years. Um, the, the county executive has increased it in other years um, to be fiscally prudent, um, as requested by the council president. Um, this, was a, this was a number that um, we settled on, knowing, um, as you stated, the importance of our uh, partners in, in the nonprofit world. It is, um, and just, just as an informational um, point, um, it is also the number that we um, used in, in discussing previously um, at our last um, council work session, uh, uh, committee work session, um, the 3% for our DD providers and our adult daycare providers. Um, and so in, in, a, in a way of keeping things equitable, um, that, um, that we would 3% um, across the board for everyone um, it, it, uh, seeking inflationary adjustments um, made sense to us. Um, and um, was it, we were able to um, increase the amounts um, that, that we will um, provide um, to our nonprofits um, and our contractors, um, but um, but also keeping within the, the uh, fiscal concerns that we have. Fair point. Uh, colleagues, do you have anything you want to add? Um, Councilmember Lukey, followed by Councilmember James. I, I respect you know you wanting to include this for future discussion um, I, I totally understand that I also understand we're in a really not great fiscal position right and you know were it up to me I'd want to do all the many things and do them well and do them to the fullest extent but I also have to you know deal with the realities that we're in um, and so you know I, I respect your your request to put that for future consideration in a separate tranche, but um, I do want to be mindful of the landscape in which we are living. Totally a fair point. That's what you're saying? Yeah, this 
post-COVID environment, losing that critical federal funding from the CARES Act is um, making us choose between apples and oranges. We want to fund everything and we want to have a smooth transition uh, for the populations that are most vulnerable in our community. And so, um, you know, our nonprofits are doing such good work too assist us um, with these efforts and I support um, Chairman Albernoz's uh, recommendation. Um, I did have a question before we move past the uh, minority health programs. I know um, we talked about the significant responses that they made in um, addressing the growing needs of our community and I'm noticing the um, vacancies and just wanted to know what the normal staff levels are across all three programs if there's anyone who can speak to that. Uh, a quick question first so we're going to dive a little deeper into the MHIPS um, in, a, in the next week. Oh, I, I didn't know if I mean we yeah, can get the answer fine. for you now Yes. Um, but if you want to wait till next yeah, week when we talk about the MHIPS specifically, okay, perfect. Um, we'll actually be able to get that number in anticipation that you're going to ask that question. Thank you. All right, so without objection, we'll agree to the 3% um, and 2 to 3 on the 2 additional percent as a tranche for consideration, acknowledging it's competing against a lot of other um, important initiatives that will be discussed. Okay, noted. Uh, the next item is the increased cost House Bill 669 grant 6.5 million and 13.4 um, FTEs. Uh, so council staff did request more information on this increase. Um, the HBC 669 grant requested and got funding for six additional FTEs to support shortfalls and enhance service de service delivery from the Social Services Family and Investment Administration. Uh, so council staff recommends uh, approval as recommended. The revenues and expenditures associated with HB669 HB are in the grant fund. While there are maybe a small portion of positions funded through the general fund, this increased cost would not be tracked in the new and enhanced program. Okay, without objection. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next item is the technical adjustment and multi-program adjustments. We combine them both because they are both related to uh, grant changes. Uh, council staff recommends approval. The revenues and expenditures for the technical adjustment are in the grant fund and are not checked in the general fund new and enhanced program. As the multi-program adjustment is negative, it is not reflected in the checking sheet. Uh, the next item was just the elimination of a long-term vacancy at 73,000 and the reduction of the 0.75 FTE. Yeah. Okay. And next item, service consolidation hubs. Uh, this is specifically food for the service consolidation hubs in the amount of 3 million uh, zero FTEs. Um, the service consolidation hubs are located out the located throughout the county and were initiated during the pandemic. The hubs brought local community partners together to provide food, distri food distribution, food home deliveries, and other social services at eight different locations. Um, as of um, FY24, there are seven locations, and DHHS did provide us some detail on the um, funding for each hub and the direct operations information. The amount that each hub will receive for the food has not been determined. So this three million, it hasn't been determined how it's going to be distributed amongst the hubs. Um, but um, and but and there is a separate uh, line item specifically for hub food supplies. Uh, so there is detail mentioned in your packet. Uh, but staff wanted to note as households recover from the pandi pandemic, it is not unreasonable to expect that fewer households in total might access the hubs. Uh, the committee may want to discuss with DHHS how they are collaborating with the hubs and monitoring the use of each hub to plan for what capacity and what services they will need during FY25 and FY26, and if those have shifted and changed um, since they opened during COVID. Um, and also, the HHS committee may want to discuss how they have been allocating the food funding over the past year. So council staff recommends approval. Um, the HHS committee may wish to have an update in the fall or winter to see how trends and needs are going um, within the program. 
I think that's a good suggestion. I concur with the, um, the executive and the staff recommendation here. I'm glad to see they're aligned. I can neither confirm nor deny that I was dressed as Santa Claus at one yes. of the food distribution <laughs> uh, centers during one of the hub uh, distribution centers. But oh, my um, yes, that's right. <laughs> um, but let me just uh, acknowledge, as we have our other important providers and partners, uh, really great work the Bobs are doing. So that they've been able to do so much more uh, than serve as a conduit. They're establishing relationships and trust and um, providing wraparound services and connecting to other services in ways that the county could not do on its own. Um, so this is one of the silver linings that came out of COVID, quite frankly. Um, and I, I just, I know all of my colleagues, all 11 of us have at some point this year or even prior to joining this council, um, volunteered to uh, distribute food and other products at these, at these hubs. Um, so I don't, have any other questions or comments? Uh, Councilmember Sales. This is um, the table on page six of the packet. Are you able to explain that table? I'm just trying to, yeah. Because I know. Yeah. The, it's not labeled at the top, which makes okay. it confusing. I think uh, at the bottom of page five, it says uh, 7122 to 323 uh, compared to 7123 to 22924. So I think it's not exactly the same amount of time, sort of a 10 months to nine months or nine months to eight months comparison. But the left is sort of the year before the of the different numbers. So total households, the first one is the first nine months of last year, the next one is the first eight months of this year, or nine months of this year. Okay, and I'm just nine. wondering the numbers in the parentheses are the difference, so that's... Yeah, so it's decreased. Some of it is we're comparing one extra month on the last year um, to this one. Um, some of it might just be uh, little changes in how much is being distributed. Yeah, it looks like a total of almost two million pounds of food in one year has decreased and so um, I'm just um, I know that last year when we discussed the hubs and what changes we were going to make um, for the upcoming year you know I fully support the continued investment of addressing food insecurity but uh, we're no longer in the uh, pandemic um, sort of era where, um, you know, we were at a critical time and people were experiencing detrimental effects. And so I know we're slowly trying to recover economically across the board. And I was hoping we would have better data showing where the ongoing needs are in our community. And I don't know how we are tracking that. I specifically requested zip code data of the households that we are continuing to see. Um, access the food um, and the unduplicated number of households because these numbers I don't know if these are um, are these the ongoing numbers of the same family or are these um, individual um, numbers so I'm just trying to understand how we came up with these numbers and um, I know that HHS responded that um, Part of the plan would be a more person-to-person -person centered approach with um, more attention to data going forward. So I don't know if you have any updates on the data-driven approach for collecting data since then. So one of the, one of the things that we've done um, this past year is to help the hubs and in, in, um, they didn't have any data uh, capacity or data collection capacity um, or analysis at all. Um, we have helped them, them a, a bit with that. Um, we've taken a lot of that in-house. Um, we're still um, defining kind of some of what this data is from each site. Um, again, if uh, one site may have two staff people, one site may have 12 staff people. Um, so we get better data from places like um, the Up County um, Services um, uh, Hub or um, from um, Clifton Park, but less so maybe from Kingdom um, or from um, from Oak Chapel so be, just because they have a, a smaller number of, of employees and so we're working on a way to, to, to clean that up for them 
um, to to provide them with the ability to collect data in a better um, in a better capacity. The zip code data is is, is the most difficult um, for us um, from a hub specific point um, because it's not something that they normally ask during distributions. Um, that they do ask for for name and 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 um, other other demographic information. They don't typically um, ask for zip code. Um, because then, then um, we find out that they're serving people from Prince George's, or they're serving people from D.C., or um, and so rather than stop the line um, for for putting people who are not Montgomery County residents out of the line, um, they just haven't um, generally asked um, zip code data. It is a little different now um, for for those who are being served by MANA. MANA does require that information. Um, the uh, those who are working with. Um, the criticism assistance providers working with um, Capillary Food Bank um, don't um, always um, pr provide that information. So it just it also depends on kind of the rules of of where the food staples are coming from. The hubs, and this is different um, th than we've had in the past. We've had a large amount of food staples um, funding that we've just done generally for all food assistance providers, including the hubs. This pulls some of that money out to give specifically to the hubs. Um, and still working with Capital Area Food Bank um, at each site. Um, the other difference, um, and I, I'm not, um, I need to check on, on this assumption, but um, some of the, the decrease in the amount of funds, um, all of the hubs have moved to a choice model, um, which requires people to get out of their cars and go shopping. Um, and so um, rather than, um, than, than generally having um, boxes available to them that they just pick up and, and keep moving. Um, and so the amount of food that's um, provided has probably decreased a bit um, because people are, are now having to get out of their cars to go. Um, and you're right, we're, we're past COVID. Um, the the uh, unemployment rate is down. So there are, there are likely less people who are requiring services from the hubs or are requiring food services or assistance from the hubs because there are other services that the hubs are now providing. Um, so um, uh, feminine hygiene products or, um, or uh, uh, baby formula, things, um, things like that, that, that are in addition to the food staples that aren't counted in these numbers. Just to touch on one other thing on the uh, using the choice model um, that is used now, it also cuts down on food being distributed that was not being used. Um, we, we had anecdotal evidence from the hubs that they just see stuff thrown in the trash can outside of it from the boxes that they were given. Um, now when they come and choose, it, they might be taking less total pounds of food, um, but they might be using the same amount of food that they got from the box or even more. So it's making us more efficient in the food delivery. It also allows us to uh, monitor and, and they uh, get uh, resources based on what's used and they don't get the stuff that doesn't get picked up. And so it allows them to better tailor the food um, to the use of the clients coming into the hubs. We're, we're in a post-pandemic era and we have very limited resources, especially if we are adapting a new model. We can't have one provider requesting zip code data, another not. There has to be consistency we have to know where we're spending the resources and who's accessing it so we can better target how much each center is getting. Um, so we have to be consistent across the board and we do need to collect that data. We do need to know where the need is and who's accessing it, especially for the Capital Area Food Bank, which serves the entire Washington metropolitan area. We cannot continue to be blind to the resources that we are giving out. We want it to serve the people who live in Montgomery County first. And so uh, we have to be consistent next year. I need a better um, idea of what data we're collecting and where the need is so that we can make better decisions going forward of how to fund these hubs. Um, I don't know how long we're going to be funding these hubs, and so we want to make sure that we're making the best decisions for the hubs. We already had to cut funding, and we um, uh, didn't fund all of the hubs based on the lack of usage of the hubs, and so if we're not consistently collecting this information, we're going to have a hard time making decisions in the next uh, fiscal year. So um, I hope we can have a better idea before this budget season ends how we're going to be collecting uh, data going into the next fiscal year. We will absolutely do that. Yep. Thank you.
Great. And we're going to get an update on the Office of Food System Resilience mm -hmm. in the next line item, so okay. that'll talk about some of the that data that that, that uh, Councilmember Sales is is referring to. All right. Um, next. So let's. I would say, um, yeah. Uh, do you support three? Yeah. Okay. So without objection, with the caveat, we'll revisit this uh, at some point within this next fiscal year. Okay. The next item is under the Office of the Chief Operating Office Officer, upgrade existing enterprise integrated uh, management system that is past the end of technical support. Uh, the request recommendation is 1.9 million zero FTEs. Uh, this is identified as one-time funding, but truly this is a project that is kind of has a three-year span. Um, and FY24, um, the the uh, the budget says. Uh, 600,000 was approved to help start the EIC moder modernization project, uh, which will begin May of 2024. In general, uh, the EICM, as it's um, called in DHHS system, is what they use for their case management. I, we had um, listened to Seth talk about it. There's other service areas that talk about it, so it's the general system used across HHS. Uh, basically, the entire system is 10 years out of date. They are using a version for 2014, so they have been um, um, modernizing the system and uh, updating it. So part of the update for this second year of, of FY25 funding is 1.9 million that is needed. Um, council staff recommends approval. As we mentioned, it's a multi-year um, and should be completed by the second quarter of FY26. So there will likely be a similar ask for FY26, uh, 1.9 million or less to support the last year of the um, the upgrade, but this is the second year of the upgrade um, with the recommend, recommended 1.9 million. So thank you. Um, obviously, we don't want anybody running anything that's 10 years out of date. But I guess one of my questions in this is if you've you've got a um, new server already, correct? And this is to fix the applications that are still out of date, or am I misunderstanding? It's um, less so a server than a platform. So Siebel is the platform that right. it was built on. Um, we are now kind of rebuilding that platform uh, onto um, a Microsoft product um, power platform. Um, that um, So we'll actually not be using Siebel at all um, once this is fully moved over. Um, Siebel um, was, was purchased by Oracle um, several years ago. They stopped updating Siebel. Um, and so uh, we wanted to make sure that we were going to a platform where um, while expensive to move, um, does in the end um, save the county lots and lots of money for not having um, any breaches of data um, or, or other security issues um, that may um, cyber from from a cyber attack or other places um, because the system is old. So well, um, that was going to be my next question because y'all are living on borrowed time. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and Siebel is a dinosaur. And Oracle is expensive, and also there are less people who are technically proficient in running Oracle systems than there are those who are running Microsoft systems. So I appreciate what you're doing and how you're, why you're making the transition. It's a tough bullet to bite when you do it, but you have to do it. And the cost, and I, I can tell you it was not a pretty place to be sitting in at a National Association of Attorneys General uh, Forum on cybersecurity, and I was the rep from Maryland right after the Maryland Department of Health had its breach, and I'm like, they're not my client, but it was not a fun place to be, right? So we don't want to be in that situation. Um, it, will this phased in, well, you know, it's, a, it's going to extend over into fiscal year 26, as noted. Will that cure and bring things up to date in terms of applications themselves? And, you know, we've talked about a number of different services here today, all of which come in different pieces of DHF, DHHS. Um, is there room within this to facilitate better crosswalking amongst those different programs and things? Because at the end of the day, to the resident who needs assistance, they just want to know this is the place I come. They don't care that there's 20 different divisions doing, you know, 30,000 different programs. They just need to know where they go to get the help. And to me, technology is an incredibly important piece of making sure we're most efficiently addressing um, service needs in the most financially prudent fashion. Right. In this particular um, uh, 
software that we're moving over is our integrated case management system mm. that is department wide. Mm -hmm. And so um, anyone um, in um, generally from public health and behavioral health are using our next gen electronic health record, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which has an interface um, with our integrated case management system. All of the other service areas are entering data. Um, into our ES EICM. So we do have um, the connection for, for um, the uh, next gen into the EICM, which allows us to capture all the data we need for all um, residents that we're serving. Um, and so this is, this is the, the main database that we use. Um, we have other, uh, other things, um, the, the um, housing management system um, that, that uh, Ms. Hong um, talked about. We have state systems. Um, the EICM also does interface with um, our with um, the the state the new state systems the the MD yes that's the one <laughs> I was gonna say MC time but that just did not sound right um, but yeah so so that interface is also allowing us to to um, uh, it's ugly with Siebel um, it'll be much easier um, for us to make adjustments um, less costly adjustments um, with a new system um, as well in our interfaces and so um, but yes this, this is this is our opportunity. Um, to be better at collecting the data across the department um, and, um, and being able to um, utilize our, our PACs, um, our, our accountability um, uh, department to, um, to look at that, so yeah. And I, and I appreciate that why public health and behavioral health couldn't have charting systems for medical care that interface with this, but I am assuming that they do use some component of this though that is not with their treatment records or, or um, other health records but there may be a flag or indicator that they're able to put in to the integrated system to know that individuals are receiving services via the public health or behavioral health service yeah every encounter that goes into next gen um, and we use that because that's our billing um, right. as well our practice management module um, but every encounter that occurs in our, um, our, our EHR gets transferred over to the EICM okay. as, a, as a visit. Okay. Um, it doesn't include the medical information um, necessarily um, just because of HIPAA and, and other concerns, um, but um, absolutely it, it shows that this, this client was seen in the HIV clinic or this client was seen on this date and this client was seen um, in, um, in behavioral health um, okay. on, on this date, but yes. Great. So there is that one place where everything is kind of gathered. Gotcha. Great. Thank you so much. Sure. Council Member Sales. I just had a quick question about the um, system since it's been 10 years since we've um, updated the system. Um, was there a reason why we weren't doing the regular updates that were released with the system? I believe there were monthly updates and was it because of training, lack of training? I'm just trying to figure out how we got here to prevent us from uh, getting here again and making this huge um, investment in one fiscal year. Right. So um, when we first started Siebel, um, it was a free platform. Um, it was um, a public use platform. Uh, and um, there were updates that we were um, able to provide um, until Oracle bought them. Um, and so when Oracle bought them, they, they talked for years about um, stopping support for it. Um, and so um, it, it, at some point, um, not within that first um, couple of years, but in, probably in the past seven or eight years, have stopped just supporting it altogether. Um, we've been able to piece things together um, by updating our servers, um, by updating some of our other um, security measures, um, but we're getting to the point now where it's not, um, the things that we're doing are not helping and our cybersecurity risk continues to go up. And so um, a couple of years ago, we decided that it was time for us to be able to move that um, to a new platform. So it wasn't that we didn't um, uh, uh, or didn't update, um, but, but we couldn't update um, because they just weren't available anymore. And so this will allow us to track uh, data across all of the <coughs> programs that serve our residents uh, more efficiently. Yes. And data trends. Uh, all right. Sounds good. Thank you. And, and because it's a Microsoft product, they have a much more robust reporting um, a, a module in there than we'd had ever with Siebel. And so we could do some back end stuff in Siebel to get some, some numbers, but um, it was never pretty. Um, the Microsoft platform will allow us to do that in a much more easy, um, easy way. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those clarifying responses. So then, without objection, colleagues? 
And council staff um, requested an update on the coding unit that was um, approved in FY24. That was um, seven FTEs and that would be offset by Medicaid revenues. DHS uh, provided us an update that the coder positions have not been filled yet, but they are estimated to be hired by the end of the fiscal year. Um, DHHS has backfilled these roles with contractual staff, but that has um, yeah, uh, resulted in some turnover. But the current projection is for Medicaid revenue to increase by at least 800000 compared to FY23. So the next item is the equity and language access. Uh, this would be an increased cost language assistance services due to increased demand, $252,000 um, and zero FTEs. Uh, so council staff recommends approval, if recommended approval, just want to note this edit in the uh, summary, that this item would actually be placed in the required by law. Um, so this fund, um, there is detail here that I can um, highlight if needed but um, this would be a required function for the department to uh, provide. Okay, the next is an update on the volunteer income tax assistance program. Uh, so there hasn't been any significant change and no committee recommendation is needed. Uh, we just wanted to provide an update on the partnerships and their outreach efforts and how they continue to enhance training. This uh, program is um, a big support for our residents who are low income. Today is tax day. <laughs> and they're being able to file their taxes. So uh, the program provided us great information about their work and what they do and just wanted to reiterate that this is largely supported by um, volunteers. And so it is um, just thank you to the volunteers for their great work and for the county being able to support this program. Council Member Sitz. Yes, I, I too want to commend the VITA program for all the great work that they do and all of the money that they are reinfusing back into uh, the economy by helping uh, folks who are low income file their taxes with trusted volunteers. Um, I wanted to get more information on the demographics of the VITA uh, population that we're serving. I noticed um, that in previous years we had multiple languages available for the um, um, flyers that raise awareness about the locations and the um, uh, process for, you know, uh, scheduling appointments. Uh, but I believe on the website we only saw the Spanish version. Is the flyer available in multiple languages? Yes, it is available. This is Betty Lamb. I'm the Chief of the Office of Community Affairs. Um, the, the flyers are normally translated into the top six languages um, that the county recognized. Um, and um, so they are French, Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and Amharic. Um, is there only ones on the website, Chantel? The Spanish on the website? I only saw the Spanish version. I didn't see the other languages on the website. Unless... Yeah, they, all, they should be on there. Well, it's you tax day. Yeah. If you, you can just... We'll, we'll double check. Yes, yes. It's been translated. Okay. And then, um, I don't know if this is available within budget, but... Um, I noticed that there were quite a few of the clients served that um, had a substantial tax debt and just wanted to know if there was a proactive component to the service to provide information about um, some of our um, workers to ensure that they understand how much tax they should set aside or proactively pay. Uh, their taxes so they're not left with a huge bill at the end of the tax year. Yes, uh, the, uh, the staff, the, the two main staff and the uh, volunteers are trained to help advise the, um, the clients who, are, who seek the VITA services in terms of how they should budget for the next year and how they should pay it down. In, uh, in terms of their tax debt so that they don't run into the same situation. So the the answer to the question, um, uh, Council Member Sales, is that we do do that as a practice. Okay, 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 okay. 
All right. Thank you. Uh, I've seen the program in action. It, it is really important and uh, does provide an important lifeline. And one of the biggest contributors to the mental health challenges we're having is just people's budget burdens. Um, and so this program does so much more than just provide tax assistance. It provides mental health relief to in a variety of ways. So thank you. So without objection. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And the the next item is the Office of Community Affairs Program Review. Um, this does not it's not a recommended item, but uh, the council requested of council staff that we prepare a more in depth review of programs and outcomes um, of one or two areas within the DHHS budget. One that was selected was the Office of Community Affairs. The other will be Dental Services. Uh, the Community Action Agency and Board is not part of this review. Um, so. So uh, as part of this, we included additional information about the Office of uh, Community Affairs. It's not a section that we talk about a lot. You know, we talk about SEF. We talk about some of our other uh, large programs. But we just wanted to get an idea of what the office did and um, the staff that were involved, the contracts they monitor, um, et cetera. So I'll just highlight that there were four staff, and a summary of their roles are included within the packet. Uh, the chart, the, D, the organization chart shows the office is responsible for uh, community outreach, disparity reduction, diversity initiatives, um, LEP compliance, and in FY25, the newcomers program is transitioning to the Office of Community Affairs as well. Uh, we asked about basic output and outcome data that they reviewed in the office, and so they listed it here. So the lang language contracts, data usage, um, the various programs like AHP, LHI, AHI, Equity and Language Access, uh, quality uh, evaluation of the workshops as they run equity workshops, and um, the language contracts use. And so I want to thank the Office of Community Affairs for providing this information. We uh, may possibly go into greater detail if requested by the committee in uh, the summer and fall if there are certain areas that you all want to prioritize um, as we look at the budget for FY25 and FY26. And um, included is also a list of the contracts that the office manages. And so with that, um, we uh, if there's any question about the detail or if there is a request to bring anything back, council staff can do that. Additional questions or thoughts? I think we're okay. Great. Thank you all very much. We now move on to, I believe, the last item mm -hmm. on our agenda for today, which is reviewing the budget of our Office of Food System Resilience. I'd like to invite Ms. Bruskin forward along. Thank you um, for coming again. So you heard a little bit of a preview on some of the questions that uh, we're going to ask about in terms of overall data collection and the system that we are building. Um, we know a lot of progress has been made. We really want to thank you, um, Director Bruskin, for all of your hard work and leadership. And I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Clemens Johnson to tee this one up and then back over to you uh, to make some opening comments, Director Bruskin. Sure, thank you so much. So the Office of Food Systems uh, Resilience is in its second year of existence. <laughs> so they are going gangbuster. Uh, the FY25 operating budget is 14.3 um, million, an increase of 13.1 million or 1,180% 1, <laughs> 1, above the FY24 approved level. There is a total of five FTEs recommended, an increase of two FTEs um, for <coughs> for FY25. Um, this packet goes over the FY25 guidance from the Council Presidents, but we visited that at the beginning of the section, session. And I will just um, call attention to the chart because most of the funding recommended for the, um, all of the funding, most of it, recommended for OFSR is new. 
all of, most of the programs are in, are listed in that program. Um, there are there is a shift that is happening of D with, between DHHS to OFSR of uh, the staff and food contracts that we're going over and potential rec reductions that have been recommended by staff. Um, but I'll stop there. For Director Russell. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you all today. I'm Heather Bruskin, the Director of the Office of Food Systems Resilience. I'm joined by my colleague, Catherine Nardi. Uh, so we thought that it would be helpful to begin with just a brief summary and landscape overview of our food security and food systems initiatives as a framing for the budget request. Um, we're there. Um, uh, but much appreciation to Ms. Clemens Johnson for all of her, her support in uh, and partnership as well as Grace Peterson. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, there we are. Thank you. It's going to fly without a net for a minute, but um, excellent. Uh, we can go to the second slide, please. Uh, so just as some context, uh, some information about the number of residents who are at risk for food insecurity. Uh, this graphic illustrates within the entire population of our county, uh, those that live, uh, those within that gold bar um, are the over 300,000 residents who live below the self-sufficiency standard, which is identified as about $100,000 a year for a family of four. Um, those that live uh, that are within the uh, orange circle uh, are those that are eligible for SNAP uh, and those that are within the green circle are those who are eligible um, on an income basis only for free and reduced rate meals. Uh, so you can see that there is a really large percentage of this population who is at risk due to income levels um, of food insecurity who are not eligible for any federal or um, likely state programs. And so that's a key focus of our work going forward is making sure that we're closing the gaps of the resources um, that we can rely on from other um, government entities. Next slide, please. We also have a major shift that's happening related to the income um, supports that we can rely on to assist our residents in terms of food access. Uh, so the uh, USDA recently came out with data that shows that food insecurity nationwide is on the rise um, from a 10 to almost 13 percent of the total population, and that is post-pandemic measurements of 2021 to 2022. We also saw just a year ago a reduction in over $7 million a month in additional SNAP benefits that Montgomery County residents were receiving. So that's impacting both our economy as well as the dollars in our residents' pockets to buy their groceries, which directly results in greater uh, reliance on our food assistance provider partners. There are also programs like the Local Food, food Purchasing Agreement, which is federally funded, which functions a lot like our Farm to Food Bank program, where there are products purchased from Montgomery County Farms that are then distributed um, to food assistance partners, but that's reliant on federal dollars. Um, we're hearing from our county partners about a 30% increase in demand for services. Uh, and then we're also seeing in um, post-pandemic measurements through the Maryland Youth Risk Behavior Survey that our black and brown middle and high school students here in Montgomery County are reporting risks of food insecurity 10 times greater uh, than their white peers. And so um, even though the public health crisis, and this gets back to uh, Council Member Sales uh, questions before about how do we know that demand for these services is uh, is ongoing. Um, the data all points to fewer resources and ongoing demand due to everything from um, global supply chain disruptions to um, overall inflation in, in costs. Next slide, please. So you, we've summarized here the initial recommendations in the FY24 budget uh, for food security programs. And so we have a number of um, programs that are annualized already to address food insecurity, uh, but with the release of the Childhood Hunger Plan in the fall of 2023, as well as ongoing demand, as we just outlined, um, as is demonstrated through the data, uh, there was the supplemental, a supplemental, a special appropriation in December of last year, uh, next slide please, which invested an additional $11 million in food security programs. 
uh, while it was as a recommendation of our childhood hunger program um, and that strategic plan, this isn't a one-time uh, need in our community. These are uh, challenges that existed pre-pandemic um, and our strategies that are closing the gaps in those federal programs, as well as investing in new strategic partnerships with a wide variety of community entities. Um, and so I've outlined here what the timeline has looked at, looked like over the past year in terms of developing these funding recommendations. So our office, uh, as was mentioned before, was only fully staffed in August of last year, uh, but very quickly was able to build on the great work of, um, of the executive and council and the food council to create that strategic plan, which gave us um, some very immediately actionable items. And so that brings us to our FY25 uh, recommended budget, which is, um, and actually we can go to the next slide because I think this is well captured in the packet already. There are a lot of moving pieces uh, to our food security landscape. The county funds already over 110 different organizations and a wide variety of strategies. Some of those, as we shared, were already in the annualized budget. Some of them are new, um, primarily funded through pandemic era programs. However, uh, these strategies have a place um, and a purpose and a demand on an annual basis. And so that is established in the county executive's recommended budget. So there's a lot of moving pieces to how we fund this work strategically, and we need to make sure that we maintain a solid foundation of the programs that both our partners and our residents have come to rely on, while we overlay that with strategic additional programs to build a new approach for the long term. And so this is a combination of grant programs, which allow us to be more inclusive, more competitive, more transparent in our funding decisions. Uh, while we also uh, continue those critical uh, distribution points that our residents frequent um, every week uh, and then supplement that with contracts uh, strategically with a wide range of partners. And this also gets to the very important request for data. It is critical with additional, um, with ongoing need and fewer resources from other sources. We need to understand uh, both where are our services being utilized? Where are our funds being um, applied? But also, how is that impacting our community? How does that help us not just with addressing immediate food insecurity, but achieving our longer term goals and the outcomes that we have for our economy, for our environmental and natural resource sustainability, as well as hunger and um, overall long term outcomes for our residents, their health and their educational achievement. I also wanted to take just a moment to outline what this will look like for our partners. That is one of the main concerns that regularly comes up, is we have established a really robust, strong network, and we can't just simply turn a switch um, and shift it to a new approach, or just simply ramp down funding. We need that thoughtful approach, which was outlined in that sort of Gantt chart that I showed just a moment ago. So for our partners, yes, this will require uh, a transition to applying in a grant style for funding, indicating what their resources are, um, but strengthening that muscle will allow them to develop uh, the ability to apply for private funding as well. So many, our food assistance provider survey indicated that the majority of our providers' funding comes from the county government, but there are foundations and other resources that are out there, but without um, working with them through technical assistance and, and support, they won't be able to apply for those grants without the tools to do that. And so this also allows us to strengthen other, other funding sources. Similarly, we're strengthening their ability to collect and report data, um, starting in the immediacy with our MANA partners uh, by, and I'll show you in a second what the portal looks like, um, but we're getting actually really valuable feedback from the partners on the benefit to their organization in collecting more data, understanding where their participants are coming from, um, and what the unique needs are on everything from cultural um, aligned products for the families as well as language access needs. Uh, this also will give them uh, the ability to know a year in advance what their funds will look like. Um, it will give them operating support, so these are funds for better wages, uh, for um, 
for building out their infrastructure, their cold storage, their um, transportation needs, and making sure that they are um, getting everything they need to operate um, effectively and, um, and sustainable in the long term. Um, next slide, please. And so you can see here what uh, our colleague Juan Cruz is on a very well-deserved vacation, but he has uh, created uh, for not just our Staples partners, but also for all the grant programs that Catherine has been um, shaping and launching data collection portals uh, that will then um, centralize all the information on where the funds are being um, distributed, who they're supporting, in which formats, um, so that we can not only know what we're doing in the moment, but know uh, where we need to invest more funds so that we can make um, thoughtful decisions and steward these public dollars as effectively as possible. And so I've already outlined what a lot of the benefits are of moving to a strategy like this, uh, but the only one that I would really want to emphasize is that we need to do more with the dollars that we're investing and while feeding people in the moment is critically important, we need to also be investing those dollars in ways that support our local farms and food and beverage businesses that um, build the health of our children uh, holistically so that we are making sure they have the nutrition they need to be successful and, and learning in the long term. Um, as well as really rooting our strategies in our equity priorities by being more transparent, inclusive, um, and being a good partner to our community-based organizations who are truly dedicated but need information and the ability to plan so that they can effectively um, support our residents in the ways that we rely on them. Uh, and so the rest is just icing on the cake if we ha if we need to come back to it for questions. But um, appreciate the chance to get to frame this for you today. Thank you. So um, we're um, very impressed. Uh, we were just kind of comparing notes, and uh, Councilmember Sales and I were just having a conversation about the need for something exactly what you just presented, yeah. but in other categories. And so I think this truly can serve as a model that we can hopefully replicate in other service area areas, um, whether it's youth development, whether it's programs for aging populations or IDD community, you name it, um, there's just some real parallels to how you've structured this and it's very impressive and exciting. Also want to recognize incredible providers, some of which are in the audience, um, for their continued dedication and leadership and helping to develop this ecosystem that's benefiting so many people. So why don't we uh, jump through and um, so that we can try to wrap up by 4.30 because I know colleagues have uh, other commitments that they have to get to and family commitments as well. I do too. Um, so, um, it's, it's a kid commitment. That's her work. <laughs> Ms. Clemens Johnson. Uh, sure. Um, so if we reference our packet and we review my fancy charts, um, we'll just start with on page five, the annualization of the food system strategy. Uh, well, uh, well, the chart on page four highlights the special appropriation update and makes comparison with the FY25 continue, continuation or um, annualizing those programs. Uh, so the first budget is the $4.3 million for annualization of the of, of uh, the seven programs that are mentioned here. So in your packet, there is a brief summary about each of the programs and where they are in terms of expenditures. We didn't provide the dollar amounts because most of the programs are grant funding, and so they have went into the grant programs. There's a total amount that says, you know, there was X amount of applications received and X amount of, of dollars that we were able to contribute, um, but we did not list the grant awards. So um, if, for each of the categories, there is a recommendation um, for the FY25 funding, and that is uh, $4.3 million. So council staff uh, recommends approval as presented. Objection? Yep. Okay. Uh, so next, uh, the food staples program. The Food Staples Program is transitioning to the Office of Food Security Systems. And I say transitioning, but uh, starting the new model of a program and trying to phase out one. We uh, provided detail on the Food Staples Program in FY24. There was a total of $12.9 um, million in Food Staples funding that was approved through ARPA funding and general funds. Uh, expenditures as of... Um, as of uh, the end of February, are 4.1 million between Capital Area uh, Area Food Bank and Manda and Mana. Excuse me. There is uh, current invoices pending for around $600,000. Um, so that 
that expenditure is, is, is not near what the budget is for um, for food staples of 12 million, only expended uh, four and a half million at this time. Uh, what was stated is that the program may have an unintentionally underspent due to waiting for periodic reappropriations and approvals to increase the amount of their contracts. Um, so we went through that process in December. I believe sometime, um, I believe October is sometimes where the, um, where our contractors have started to spend their dollars slowly anticipating that they may or may not get funding. So that, that may be one cause, but uh, OFSR can, uh, provide any details that are needed. So, um, council staff uh, just noted that the expenditures are at 32 percent, and um, there may want to request an update on the uh, program and demand partners are seeing in the community for FY24. Briefly, Ms. Preston, could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so it's really challenging for our partners to be able to predict uh, and spend funds accordingly. So, uh, and it also takes time in contracting processes. So we have structured this in a way that the grant program would be October to October in an annual basis to allow us to um, basically continue the Staples program through uh, with sufficient funding, only adding one additional million dollars on top of the special appropriation funds to carry those partners through through October and then hopefully provide some type of cushion should they see uh, negative impacts following the, the grant process and, and those award announcements. But our goal is to uh, be able to straddle budget cycles so that we can avoid these uh, stops and starts in, um, in funding. And so um, I think the one thing that we, the main thing that we hear from partners is the ability to have a year's worth of information um, because it isn't just, a, unfortunately, a dimmer switch that you can turn up and down on a consistent basis. Uh, but the $7 million total for the community grants uh, program that is basically uh, the next phase, the, the Staples Program 2.0, is based on the monthly spending uh, that we were consistently seeing from partners who were non-hub entities. Uh, and so uh, that is something that um, was rooted in the, the spending that we've seen over the past year. Gotcha. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So we'll move to the next item, the Community Food Assistance Competitive Grant Program. Uh, this is the food staples transition of three and a half million is recommended of uh, county general funds. Uh, so this would be transitioning the current food staples program to a uh, new model, um, a grant program. Um, this would uh, this transition would allow the county to be less involved in food purchasing and distribution, and will support the networks and distribution systems within the community. Um, so council staff did ask the OFSR to provide detail on the new grant program and structure, and they. Uh, provided the following, which is uh, detailed in your packet. They anticipate receiving up to 70 to 100 applications, and um, they do have priorities, which are like operating a participant choice model that we have just talked about, um, consider novel approaches, creative ideas by the community organizations, um, lever additional, leverage additional resources to support, to support the programs, like through in-kind dollars or organizational investments. So, um, the council staff uh, recommends approval of the new program, providing grants to community partners directly, um, supports increased funding transparency, data collection, and the ability for organizations to design a food distribution program that meets the unique, unique needs of the communities they serve. So previously with food staples, uh, Capital Area Food Bank and MANA uh, would subcontract, if you want to call it, with other smaller providers, and this would allow the providers to apply for the grant program. They could design their grant program the way they would like budgetarily and include um, needs for, you know, personnel operations, which they can't really do now. Uh, so I think that's the idea behind the cap the community, the competitive grant program, and, um, and moves us out of the COVID response model of food staples and into a, um, a new model. Council Member Sales. I just had a quick question about the uh, RS, RESJ goals and how we're going to ensure that the, we're meeting them with this new system going forward. 
I appreciate that question, and we're very lucky to sit on the same floor as the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice, uh, and so they are close colleagues and very valuable advisors to us in the work that we do in shaping these programs. Uh, so that is actually a, a big hope that we can move towards our equity goals by uh, allowing all partners who are in the space uh, to apply and to have a variety of award scales. Uh, so there is not one size fits all uh, in terms of grant programs, but there are some large scale providers who provide support to a wide variety of communities. And then there are smaller providers who have close relationships with specific demographic or geographic populations. Uh, and so this would enable us to provide support to them uh, and also be able to uh, allow them more flexibility in spending their funds so that they can access unique products that aren't currently available on the Staples platforms. Uh, so it will give our partners more flexibility uh, in terms of how they support residents. It also will allow them, like I shared before, to pay fair wages, uh, to provide potentially additional benefits. Uh, so many of these organizations are, we're giving them food to distribute and that is critically important, but we're not investing in their work as, as employers or, or community leaders as well as um, critical pieces of our resilient system. Thank you, that was all. Without objection. The next item is the uh, Food Staples pro Program Transition Through Pandemic Providers, $1.75 million. Uh, so this would provide funding for Capital Area Food Bank and MANA to continue to run the program as is through October. Uh, council staff recommends approval. Um, the uh, it is recommended that the committee request an update by September 2024 on closing out food staples and the status of the Community Food Assistance Grant Program at that time. Good idea. Without objection. Okay. The next item is uh, administrative support for uh, those two entities during the food staples transition of $1.1 million. Uh, the, uh, the, your packet lists the distribution amongst the two organizations. Mm -hmm. Council uh, staff recommends approval um, and that I, I did suggest that the, co the committee may want more information on the role of Capital Area Food Bank and MANA in the, the new program. They have been our, our strong supporters through food staples and then October they lose this funding and lose this administration of this program. So for an organization that can um, have a big impact. So I just wanted to highlight that and, um, and give uh, the office an opportunity to respond. Yeah, if you could, that's it. Yes, so uh, there's basically the first quarter of FY25, which is continuation of the existing Staples programs. And so our hope is that our partners will see as minimal disruption as possible. Um, but we also know that that has been a key piece of supporting Capital Area Food Bank and MANA's role as core partners and really the backbone of a lot of our um, infrastructure related to food purchasing, distribution, the Capital Area Food Bank is the Feeding America partner for Montgomery County, which means that they are our conduit for a wide variety of federal food resources, and we don't want to have unintended consequences of uh, shifting these programs on the stability of um, our access to those resources. And so our conversations with Capital Area Food Bank have indicated that uh, they will uh, be able to continue offering a storefront that's specific for Montgomery County partners to be able to um, avoid the supply chain disruptions that are still happening regardless of whether we're in a pandemic or not, um, as well as access to palletized produce, so large scale purchases um, that our individual providers can't get, as well as technical assistance. And getting to the question earlier um, related to the hubs, all Capital Area Food Bank partners are required to move to their Service Insights platform by, I believe, 2026. And that provides not just reporting on who you're um, serving in terms of zip codes, but it has case management properties as well. And so uh, a long-term relationship with them is critically important to make sure we can have uh, data sharing agreements and that we don't 
shut off, you know, turn on one hose and, and shut off the other. Uh, Mana Food Center has been an absolutely critical partner in so many different um, aspects of our pandemic work and our work as we transition out of that phase. Uh, and so their continued partnership in working with the smaller partners in particular, they're currently still working with 22 organizations, um, is really important to, um, to not move beyond as well. I just, I just want to thank Jackie since she's sitting here for raising to um, uh, needing to evaluate the choice pantry model and also since you just mentioned the case management component of the software how important the choice pantry model is in the connectivity the people piece of this in terms of being able to have those interactions that you wouldn't necessarily have when someone's picking up a grab-and-go kind of situation um, it gives you a lot more valuable information. It's also making sure the person has agency in what they are selecting and that it is right for them, um, which is which is part of an overall better outcome for everyone. So um, I wanted to thank you for that and um, thank you for updating us that that data would be collected and you know sort of better able to share and then help to manage programs moving forward in the future. So thank you. Okay. Uh, the next item is item F, the shifting staff and food contracts from DHHS, $2.2 million and one um, FTE. So uh, this is shifting 17 food-related contracts in a PM1 position from DHHS. Um, uh, the 17 contracts total 2.1 million. The other portion is the uh, staff salary. Uh, this amount also includes a 3% adjustment of, across all contracts. All food related contracts in DHHS were shifted to OFSR except for the senior nutrition programs and food provided by the service consolidation hubs. And so, staff, uh, council staff recommends approval of this item. Objection. Okay. And increased contract monitoring capacity, there will be one FTE supporting the food-related contracts coming from DHHS, and there is a recommended uh, PM1 position also, another contract uh, position supporting the OFSR, group, uh, OFSR growth, um, given the number of grant agreements, contracts, and contract fiscal monitoring that will be needed to support the new programs. Uh, Council staff, and staff uh, recommends approval, and this would be on the new and enhanced program category. Section. Okay, and um, FEMA reimbursement item. So uh, there was in the county executive's recommendation of the FEMA reimbursement funds that were received, uh, food staples in the amount of three and a half million dollars was included. So if that three and a half million dollars is approved, that would be a total of seven million dollars for the new community food assistance competitive grant program. Uh, council staff uh, made a recommendation to add to the potential reductions that this funding could be split into two tranches of 1.75 each uh, to potentially approve partial or full, fund or full funding. The committee could revisit this after the first quarter of FY25 um, when the program has launched to learn how many organizations applied for the funding, grant amounts, and any update on the transition of the food staples, you know, if that program needs to continue. So. Um, just because this is new program, uh, new funding, staff made this recommendation of, um, of the potential re reduction. Um, Thank you. Um, and I, I, I like the approach of taking the time to see the thing that's being stood up and to see how it's working so that we can then figure out what needs to be done to support that better. Um, so I do support the council staff's recommendation on that front. And um, I didn't say this earlier when we were talking about the grant program specifically, but one of the things that I know that has been a challenge over time, whether it's here in Montgomery County or it was whether it was with grants that the state was doing for different things, is when personnel expenses are supported by grant funds, but then if they don't get a grant award or the grant award doesn't adjust in a certain direction, and they say, but I have this person. There's a challenge with that because it's not the county's personnel and it's not like with grant funds. And you know, we, we were talking with the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security this morning because a lot of theirs are funded through grants through FEMA. And you don't know 
especially every time the federal government has a budget issue, what is or isn't going to happen moving forward, right? Um, and so I just do want to make sure that as we move forward with the Community Food Assistance Competitive Grant Program, yes, we should do things that will support the operations and that includes personnel, but we have to be mindful of the language that's in the grant applications to note that that's not guaranteed funding moving on year after year because these are grants, they're not contracts for services. So um, with that, that's my recommendation. Ms. Breskin, did you want to respond? I did, yes, thank you. So I would note that the total $7 million is what is projected to be needed for the annual grant program. It was indicated in the budget in split funding sources, but that plan based on if we wanted to continue to support partners at current levels, uh, $7 million is what's needed. Uh, and the goal is in order to be on an October to October cycle to uh, run the program, basically launch it as soon uh, as a budget would be finalized so that we can make announcements and give them a full year to, um, to plan. So make those announcements in August. So if we revisited, we would, if we partially funded and revisited, then we would basically be in the same situation we were in the past year, where we would either have to renew, uh, run a whole other grant program, or force our uh, partners to basically take a gamble and, and plan uh, with only six months um, of funding. So I think especially when we're considering these funds could be used for, um, for staffing, um, then we would really need to um, give them a year's worth of information so that they can plan accordingly. Um, the other aspect that I just wanted to note is the Office of Grants Management has been an exceptional partner in this work. Um, and there is the possibility in annualized grant programs of having renewed funding to allow even greater predictability, obviously based on appropriations and based on performance. But um, there is ways to use grants to be actually a much more intentional and thoughtful long-term partner because I ran nonprofits for a long time and I know that very difficult situation of um, of not knowing where the, the long-term resources will come for your staff. Uh, looks like Dr. Stoddard is joined us. Yeah, I, I, thank you very much. Earl, Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. I, I just want to note when we were sitting before the GO HHS Joint Committee talking about the supplemental last year, one of the, one of the criticisms that we received and what we received from partners is um, doing it via the fund at the budget, fund it through a supplemental later. Uh, the tricky thing with that is that the organizations can't plan for the full year and they'll they'll pretend or they'll operate, I shouldn't pretend, they'll operate under the pretense that what they get is what they need to dole, spread out over the course of the full year because they can't operate as if more money might come in the third or fourth quarter and they might have to, if it doesn't come, then they have to fire the person that they hired in the first quarter so that they really do operate under the pretense that whatever you give them is going to be their full year allocation. And if you add in more money later, they figure out how to use it, but it makes it very difficult for them. And so we heard what the council said, and I remember very specifically the council president was very uh, direct uh, with us to say that, you know, it would be, it is much better to do this as a one-time thing as opposed to parse this out over the course of the year um, and so we, we we really took a lot of time in the in the uh, we took that to heart and we really took a lot of time in the in the in the intervening months to determine what the actual need was going to be for the year that we were comfortable being able to distribute and that we would had we had real comfort in knowing that we ha we have way more than that community need. I mean, we will not be addressing the entire food community need with the seven million dollars. And so, our intention with this was to uh, have this be the singular ask for the year and not have returned to the council for a supplemental in this space. I appreciate that. I'll just make two additional points. And I really, um, of course, appreciate and respect Councilmember Lukey's position and the staff recommendation. But I still have some scars from that conversation that we had through the joint committee session a few months ago. And I'll note, you know, we, we, we made that decision um, in part at the time because there were so many more moving parts with the budget. We didn't exactly know where we were going to land with the potential for additional taxes. Um, we also weren't exactly sure how the expiration of the federal funding was going to play into the overall makeup. And so um, it was the committee's recommendation that we split this up um, in concurrence with the executive branch. But that created 
some challenges uh, administratively and operationally for these facilities. And I do also, lastly, um, we have much more information now than we did last year. And so we are in a better position to be able to predict. And so for those reasons, um, I will support the executive branch's recommendation in this case, but very much respect. And I don't know if in light of that, those comments, Councilman Maliki, you feel differently. Yeah, no, I, I look. And it's okay. <laughs> I appreciate the need. This is gonna be one of those two to one yes. votes simply because we're, and, and this has nothing to do with, with you or your leadership because you're amazing. Um, it has everything to do with the fact that I, I feel like what we can afford is half and that we can't afford the rest and we're trying to not violate our own policies by increasing our bond debt limit by $20 million, which to me, and I've said it many times, is fiscally irresponsible. And so as much as there is validity to doing a great many things, I'm trying to be mindful of some balance. And this was one of those places where we have an opportunity to strike a better balance um, and not go for that whole 20 million that is um, currently before us. So um, with that, I'm gonna say where I am. I appreciate you all yeah. and your perspectives. So I think we're two to one on that one. Two uh, recommending the executive's position, one recommending the staff recommendation. All right, uh, I think is that it? All right, thank you all very much. Uh, with that, we are adjourned.